I move for a bad court thingy. You mean a mistrial? Yeah. That's why you're the judge and I'm the law-talking guy. The lawyer. Right. So it's time to start day six. But before we do, I just want to say thanks to a viewer named Pinky for making me realize I need to be a little bit more clear about something I said in the last video. And I apologize that I haven't added a whole lot to these because I've been trying to get them out as quickly as possible. So I've mostly just been concentrating on the editing. So as far as George Torres is concerned, I do have some negative opinions about him, but he is indeed the victim in this case. He paid the ultimate price for being with Sarah, but that's sort of the problem. In order to stay with Sarah, as a man, you're going to have to defend yourself sooner or later. If you're with a woman who's willing to get up in your face or be violent toward you, you have to leave. You cannot stay. And George is proof of that. Look at what happened to him. Agreeing to stay in this relationship with this vile woman is also an agreement to whatever the outcome may be. And based on the evidence that's in this case, George was not 100% innocent. I don't know how Sarah got poked so deeply in the leg, but apparently she had to have surgery. And the prosecution never debunked this story. And I'm not sure they really needed to. But if they could have, I'm pretty sure they would have right? Even the psychiatrist who was called in by the prosecution agreed that Sarah indeed suffered from battered spouse syndrome. Honestly, I don't even agree with that. I don't think she's a battered spouse at all. I think she gets exactly what she's looking for all the time. This trial seems to be the only time she didn't get what she wanted. There's also another story that the property manager told about George being so drunk that he stumbled into the wrong apartment. And when the woman came home, she found George in her bedroom screaming for Sarah. He was just too drunk to realize he was in the wrong townhouse. And I've got to admit, I have very little patience for that sort of thing. The property manager also mentioned that she had seen video footage of the two of them beating on each other. But in the defense of George, I do believe that Sarah was indeed the aggressor. And after she got that no contact order in place, she used it to control his every move. And let's just reverse this whole thing. Let's say that it was Sarah who ended up in the suitcase and George was the defendant. In that case, I'd still be saying that the defendant needs to go to prison. But if George was the defendant in this case, do you think we would have really spent all this time claiming self-defense? They would have locked George away and thrown away the key years ago. There is no way they would have let him delay this case for four and a half years like they allowed Sarah to do. Is it unfair? Yes, it is. But that's the reason George shouldn't have stayed with Sarah. She had all the power. You should never let anyone control you that way. And at the end of the day, most of my concern is for the kid, Sarah and Brian's son. George, Sarah, and Brian all contributed to a terrible situation for that kid. George and Sarah for obvious reasons. But Brian too, because he enabled the entire thing by paying their rent and bills. And I suppose he was just doing it so that his son would have a mother to go and visit once in a while. But these two were drunk all the time. The property manager said it was common to see Sarah and and George stumbling around drunk in the parking lot as early as 9 a.m. This just isn't a good place for a child. But if I just wanted to make it really, really simple, I could just say this. Getting to know Sarah in all this body camera footage and in the trial, I can't help but lose respect for both Brian and George because you'd really have to lower yourself to put up with this woman. I look at her and I see a woman who isn't worth it. Seriously, I'd rather live in a van down by the river rather than to spend one minute with this woman. That said, let's finally get started on day six. Here we go. Ma'am, good morning. Can you please state your full name and date of birth for the record for me? Sarah Boone, 101077. Miss right, Boone is seated at council's table wearing a light gray suit and a white blouse. She is in custody, however, will not be wearing any restraints. As such, we will continue to stand when our jury enters and exits. Are we ready to go ahead and bring in our jury at this time? State. Yes, sir. Defense. Yes, sir. All right, let's stand and bring in our jury. All right, members of the jury, you can be seated. Amateur members of the jury, good morning. Welcome back to 12 Alpha of the Orange County Courthouse. Uh, members of the jury, before the state continues with their evidence presentation today, I just have a couple of questions to go over with you. Yesterday, there was an event in the courtyard of the uh, Orange County Courthouse. Did anyone happen to observe that event? If you did, please raise your hands at this time. What do you mean by observe? We'll get to it. Okay. okay. Did anyone happen to hear anything during that event? All right, and record reflects no hands have been raised. Did anyone see anything during that event? All right, juror number two, first row. Thank you, ma'am. Did anyone participate in that event? 
I could reflect no hands have been raised. Did anyone receive any writings or review any material from that event? I could reflect no one has raised their hands. Can the parties approach for a moment? All right. Uh, members of the jury, I'm going to send everyone out except for juror number two in the first row. Uh, we've got a couple follow-up questions for you individually, ma'am. Same instruction I've given you all previously. Please don't conduct any independent investigation or research as to the person, places, things, or charge involved. And don't have any discussions amongst yourselves or anyone else, and we'll bring you back in as promptly as possible. Thank you. Well, may be seated. Thank you. Juror in seat two on the first row from right to left. Um, you uh, had advised, based on the court's question, that you had observed something, and you said, what does observed means? And instead of uh, getting that out in front of every other juror, we just want to have that individual conversation with you now. So tell me what it is that you saw or heard or anything yesterday in the, in the courtyard yesterday. When I was, we were walking back from lunch, and they, we saw that they were gathered, and I asked the deputy if he knew what was going on, and he said it was the somebody... Bain talking about domestic violence. Okay. And you said we were walking. Who's we? Um, another juror. I don't want to say her name. Okay. All right. Um, do, is that a juror that was on our panel here? Yes. Okay. All right. Do you recall where they may have been seated? <sighs> no. In the back over there. Okay. All right. Do you recall what uh, color her hair was? Yes. You, what, you know, you? Please. Dark brown or black? Is it the shorter juror? Okay, thank you very much. State, any further questions? And after um, you were told what was going on, then what happened? I walked back in. All right. Did you hear any of the speakers? I couldn't or? hear anything. No. Oh. Anything further from the defense? Ma'am, did that affect your ability to be fair and impartial? Yes. Thank you. Can the parties approach for a moment? We appreciate you, ma'am. Thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and bring in the balance of the panel. You can just hang out where you're at, okay? Right, Y'all can be seated. Thank you. Mr. J, you may proceed, sir. Permission to publish from States 21, which was previously marked as P for identification. You may proceed, sir. Again, this is a DVD exhibit with two folders in the main directory. One entry is in a, a folder called Attachments. Another is a PDF labeled Extraction. For the record, it is 108 pages on page one. Creation time for notes, 749, asking Jorge or George not to be uh, despicable to me, making more drink after he guzzled his and I shared mine. On page two, date uh, March 8th, 2018, you are now in a rela relationship with Jorge or George on Facebook. Page three, May 21st, 2019, from... 407 846 to Melissa, and he can still live here, correct? Or until I decide to finally get him out if he doesn't change, clean up his act after tomorrow. On page 9, May 30th, 2019, from a contact labeled as Mom, Peren, Jorge, or George, to 407 uh, which I will just refer to as owner um, in future references. Where is my clippers in the gray box? From owner to mom, Jorge, all capitals, dumpster, separate <coughs> message, like you, separate message, so is your two shirts, separate message, no more Rick and Morty, a response from contact mom, Jorge, to owner, okay, okay. From owner to mom, Jorge, Lucas cried when he saw the adventure fund was gone. Thank you. No wonder you're out. Fuck off. From owner, he's the one that broke it because you took it. From owner, wanted to go on adventure. On to page 10. From owner, be proud. Feel good. He made my, quote unquote, our son cry. Cheese stick, Lucas, your kids, get the fuck out of my life and my sons. No one, no one, no one, spinster, good, for nothing, dumpster diver, that's what you are and the rest of you. Later on on this same page, owner to mom Jorge, get, 
all of you. Mean, selfish, fuck all you. Your firstborn is a joke. Going on to page 11, same date of May 30th, 2019, from owner to mom, Jorge, get the fuck out of my life. Lucas two, bad influence. From Jorge to owner, I am, as you can see, go drink your life away. From owner to mom, Jorge, your kids are two. Yuck, shucks, I only have one. Beaters, your three together. Yuck, going on to page 12. From owner to mom, Jorge, still dated 5-30-2019. Gross, and all the time, gross. Mom, Jorge to owner, I love that guy. I love that guy. You're the one who kicked me out. Owner to Jorge, mom, finally. Get your shot together and check me out in two to three months. Hope you're there. Unless I find someone better. Shit. Together. From mom, Jorge, to owner. Are you serious? Are you serious? Owner to mom, Jorge. That's what happens? No. Mom, Jorge, to owner. I'm helping out dad right now. Call you in a few. Owner to mom, Jorge. Can you help me put out, fuck off, Jorge, mom, to owner? How? No problem. To owner? Damn, you, you can only talk when you're drunk and talking shit. Owner, to the previously mentioned 267 number, stop calling, texting my phone. He's not here anymore. And it's damn. 267 number to owner. NP, you didn't have to be a bitch about it. Owner to 267, still May 30th, 2019. Yo, I like you all. He's a dick and the sheriff just left. Sorry I couldn't text back. I'll always respect you all. You know that he's not here anymore. And yes, I am a bitch. So are you. 267 to owner. Look, I'm not here to be taking shots at you. I never called you a bitch. I said you were acting like one. I'm not going to be here going back and forth on some childish shit. Have a good night. Owner to, six, to the 267 number. Friends forever, thank you. Would love to chat sometime. Call his parents, I guess. Further down on page 13, now on to May 31st, 2019, from owner to mom, Jorge. Tell Jorge to call me. I want my things he took. I have his birth certificate and propane certificate. Until then, if he wants those back. And I have your quote unquote art box. Mom, Jorge to owner, stop being petty. I did not take anything that wasn't mine, I swear. Owner to mom, Jorge, you're a liar. I never can believe you from all the other lies. You stop being petty and take shit like you always do. Another one bites the dust, Jorge. Hope you're miserable like you've made everyone else. Mom, Jorge to owner, I'm not lying. Owner to mom, Jorge, Lucas said he won't miss you either. When I get mine back, you'll get yours. Mom, Jorge to owner, I didn't take it. I'm coming over in a few to get my stuff and I'm coming with Jean and Melissa. Going on to page 14. Owner to mom, Jorge, go for it. Bring mine, W. Mom, Jorge to owner. I don't have anything of yours. That's why I'm coming with them so they can vary, vary that. Owner to mom, Jorge, I don't care. They're not going to babysit you because you're an asshole and got kicked out after being taken off the lease. Mom, Jorge to owner, they seen what I had in my hands. Owner to mom, Jorge, Still don't care or believe you. I'm going to get Lucas anyway, so don't waste their time or mine. Mom, Jorge to owner, exactly. Owner to mom, Jorge, you were a visitor and a terrible resident, boyfriend too. Just go away unless you bring my stuff. Mom, Jorge to owner, I don't have your shit, Sarah. I need my birth certificate. Owner to mom, Jorge, I don't give a shit either. I worked for that birth certificate, voter's registration, and your ID card. Just because your name is on them doesn't make them yours. 
even paid for them. I needed you to be a man and take care of me, not beat me, call me names, and make me feel like I'm not a person. Not giving back until I have mine. Mom Jorge to owner, whatever, Sarah. Owner to Mom Jorge. Next step is restraining order. Know that. You can come over here a hundred times. Doesn't mean I have to open the door. Good one, Jorge. Go away. Mom Jorge to owner, whatever. Owner to Mom Jorge. It's been a great day without you. Will be from now on. Mom Jorge to owner. You need to do owner to Mom Jorge. Enjoy living with your parents at 41 with no girlfriend and lonely. It was the inevitable, just like it has been before. Owner to Jorge, mom, did you take Lucas's sunglasses? Mom, Jorge to owner, OMFG, no, I did not. Turning to June 2nd, page 15, 11057 AM, from owner to mom, Jorge. Jorge, question mark, call me. If Jorge is with you, can you have him call me, please? Text to Mo, 118, 16 seconds on June 2nd. Owner to mom, Jorge, I beat you to the punch. One, do the dartboard with me? Come. Owner to Mo, I know you won't answer, Mo. Tell him to come finish the dartboard with me, please. Owner to Mo, I miss him. Owner to mom, Jorge, Ask Jorge to call me, please, when he gets a minute. June 2nd, 743 40 a.m. Can you have Jorge call me, please, when he gets a chance if he's with you? 745 a.m. Owner to Mo. Going on to page 16, June 2nd, 2019, 1050 a.m. 55 seconds. Owner to Mo. Uh, hello. Can you please have Jorge call me? Willing to give back. Don't know if he's there or at parents. Really want to see him. Owner to mom Jorge at 10.52, 16 a.m. Not pursuing after 12 o'clock ever again. 12.19 p.m., 23 seconds. Owner to mom Jorge, please call. Come over. I'll come get you. Come over, please. I need a super hug. Hugs, please need you. 6.23 p.m., owner to Anna. He doesn't live here anymore. Call parents or Mo in response to an incoming phone call that was made at 6.10 p.m. 54 seconds from Anna to owner. Entries 9803-9804 in the PDF timeline, June 2nd, 2019. Image 0092.heic, capture time 6.3301 p.m. Image 0093 HEIC captured 6.33.26 p.m. 6.34 p.m. 51 seconds, June 2nd, 2019. Outgoing from owner to mom Jorge. All up to you now, big boy. And for the record, uh, those images were sent to mom Jorge at 6.34 p.m. 33 seconds. Look what you made me do. Or maybe your mom will for you. Response from mom Jorge to owner. Wow, that's really childish. Owner to mom Jorge, but effective. Mom Jorge to owner. Yeah, I see what you are doing. Did Lucas leave? Owner to mom Jorge. I'm watching shadows. Be gone for good. Minus birth certificate. Mom Jorge to owner. Okay, cool. Enjoy. Owner to mom Jorge. Am. Nice, you're not. And nice was from mom Jorge to uh, owner. Going on to page 17, this is still June 2nd, 2019. Mom Jorge to owner, yes I am. You are not though. Owner to mom Jorge, to who? Your mom, brothers, not me. Mom Jorge to owner, to everyone. Owner to mom Jorge, but me. Mom Jorge to owner, I love you. Owner to mom Jorge, I'm going out at eight. Get dressed, I've given you since noon. Peace out, Boy Scout. Mom Jorge to owner, I'm coming over with a handle. I was helping Pop all day cut grass. Owner to mom Jorge, yay you. Getting in the shower then out, Bye bye Mom Jorge to owner. Excuse me, can we approach the bench? Yes. 
Objections overruled. I'm already showered and dressed. Mom Jorge to owner. Hello? Text from Anna to owner. You're rude as hell, but okay. Owner to Anna. Your dad is a POS, but okay. At least you know and will stop calling. Owner to Anna. Futile. Anna to owner. CTFU as you are a piece of shit, but that's God's business, not mine. Have a good day, Coke whore. Since you like to switch it up, I'll do the same. Don't text me back either. Fake ass. Page 20 of 108, June 9th, 2019. From owner to Philip. He's off the lease. The process has begun. Page 22, June 11th, 2019. Metadata only shows to mom Jorge. You tell your son he's not welcome here. Taken off the lease and bound. Worthless. Don't show his ugly fucked up face around here again. Police will be called. Ask him if it was worth it and ride my bike he has. Stay Hispanic. That's what you all are. And he can watch all the porn he wants from the phone mom gave him. Page 26, June 14th, 2019, 11.38.56pm. To mom Jorge. Wow. Congrats. Blackouts and whoring. We wanted to see him. Hot house. Seven people. Mission to work on my bike. Repeat. Candy crush. Fuck himself. Shit job. Repeat. Same page. June 15th, 2019, 7.37 p.m., 48 seconds. To Melissa. Just an FYI, if my place gets effed up, I'm letting you know. He's in jail. Thanks for the prompts. I'm at my ex's house. Please don't let this reflect on me as a tenant. You said to call cops. I did. He's gone. We're both proud now. I consider you my friend. Melissa, why was he in your apartment? Page 38. Notes. Creation time, June 26, 2019, 5.56.57 a.m. 614 X videos, 10.03 a.m. Sarah Banks, 53 Bank, 613. Metro activa Activation, 612. X videos, 62, 6.13 p.m. X videos, 61. X videos, 531, 956A. Who's Christine? Friend FB, going to meet up, question, calling her beautiful, question, said she thought you were avoiding her, when down here, said no, I was not beautiful, FB dash nonchalant quay, thanks for adding me, you are exquisite, Facebook messaging Camille, 613, 942, Facebook, or FB, Pamela Erickson, sending pictures of yourself, telling her good morning, 714, 1213 a.m., FB dash crystal, going to woo her, sweep her off her feet, going to change her mind. Luck is my middle name, sent her pics, kiss emojis, called her beautiful after returning to the convo, Send, said you had to pick up your brother, sent pics of beer, sent her struts, could have been me, sent her songs but not me, messaged bunny kiss emojis, Kant convo, sent puppy kiss emoji, would love to take her out and see a movie. Told her about what we do in the shadows. Would love to watch Creed 2 with her. Want to snuggle with her and eat popcorn. Sent heart-hugging animal emoji. Want to play a board game with her. Asked to FaceTime call her. Called her amazing messaging at 7.30 a 6.14, 6.15, two days. FB dash Crystal liking all her posts. Quote, losing someone who doesn't respect or appreciate you is actually a gain, not a loss. Can't compare me to the next girl because there is no competition. I'm one of a kind and that's real. <laughs> Continuing on to page 39. Same note. I found everything on your phone. All your messenger texts. Telling Christine you want to meet up with her when she's here. Calling her beautiful. Thanking nonchalant Quay for adding you. And calling her exquisite. Telling Pamela Anderson Erickson good morning and sending pictures at 12.38 a.m. Messaging Camille, then the whole two-day convo with Crystal. How dare you? And send pictures wearing my wedding ring. You're a cheating, lying scumbag. I will never trust you. Why don't you put your mugshot up or I will, I will since I have your phone and log in and tell everyone why you were in jail for the third time. Let them know you beat your wife and she put you there because she couldn't take it anymore. 
I want nothing to do with you ever again. I've become a different person since you've been gone with less stress, anxiety, and worry. I feel safe, comfortable, happier with you not here or seeing you at all. I can say through, I do have heart, heartbreak after going through your phone. Thank you for always proving me right. I knew when you told me your mom gave you one that you'd be back to your slimy ways. You will never change. I hope it was all worth it, all of it, including taking losing my debit card for the third time to buy beer and cigarettes, which put you back where you belong. I know for a fact you were not worth any of it. I just can't believe after everything, everything I've done for you, including all I did to get you out of jail, and you do this to me. This is cheating. Goes on to page 40, goes on to page 41, and ends with never truly yours. Page 42, June 26th, 2019, 8.06 p.m., 16 seconds. Outgoing from owner to Mo. Just wanted to let you know to tell Jorge I found all his messages, hissy face heart emojis, with Crystal and other bitches on FB, along with all his porn after he swore to me he wasn't doing any of that anymore. I'm not doing anything more for him and he will try and keep him in jail as long as I can. Cheating snake weasel, ask him all about it or have your parents the next time they talk to him. I'm not anymore. So hurtful after all I've done for him, he can rot in there for all I care. Going on to page 43, to Mo from owner, and I will be there for the hearing next week and his arraignment on both charges. Peace out, fucks, a.k.a. Torres. Same page 43, from owner to Mo, 626, 2019, 9.59, 14 p.m. Begins, hi, I was thinking if you could get out, I'd really love it if you'd take me to a movie, or we could snuggle like we do and watch Creed 2, get some popcorn and pretzels, maybe talk about what kind of other movies we like or find a fun board game to play together, I know your favorite is Avalone. What do you think? I was also thinking the other day about how much I miss you sending me pictures of yourself throughout the day, sending me songs you wanted to hear or thought I'd like, but what I really miss are the kissy love emojis you would send just because I really miss those, especially the ones with hearts. They'd always make me smile. I knew you were thinking about me. You do Crystal though, even asked her to FaceTime. What would you do if you found me having this convo with Ben or John or anyone other than you? I'd be beaten to a bloody pulp. And don't do any of these things anymore, but yet you wear your wedding ring and mine around your neck and tell me how much you love me. But you're telling this woman who looks like TPT you want to snuggle with, take out to a movie, play board games with, questions, sending music, cutesy, kissy, love emojis to like you used to me, Telling her you want to woo her, sweep her off her feet. How do you think that makes me feel? How don't, why don't you say that to me? Going on through the rest of page 43, page 44, including on page 44, dirty cheat. Enjoy your porn and jerking yourself off secretly so your parents don't see you and your ugly new girlfriends. I can't wait to finally be with a real man, Ben, who will and has taken care of me. Can't wait to see what he's like in bed. I already know he kisses. Hope it was all worth it. I'm free. As you told Crystal in your messenger text, you're single with a little cutesy dancing dinosaur. Wow. Now you really are. You're despicable. Next text is XOXO from Mo to owner. Page 50, 628, 2019, 10.55, 47 p.m. from owner to Mo. Just know... I can do so much more damage than all of you put together. Know that. Going on to page 51. Try me. Page 72, Ju July 20th, 2019, 11, 11, 4 p.m. From Janice to owner. No metadata, but from Janice. Sorry it's so late. I just read your text. He seemed fine when I saw him at your apartment this morning. He answered the door right away, but was quite bummed out that he overslept but I was okay and told him, no problem, just get ready and come in, come to work in about half an hour. Then I texted your phone and asked if he would rather work the afternoon shift and get some sleep, but he never answered, so I have no idea where he is or what he's doing. What la happened last night, he had a black eye. He said it was new because I asked him and I told him to put makeup on it. He said he had taken, had that taken care of. Did you two get in it again? He acted like when I told him he, had a black guy, 
At first, he didn't know what I was talking about. I guess he kind of blacked out. You can call me back if you want. 11.30 p.m., 38 seconds. From owner to mom, Jorge. Janice just called me looking for Jorge, and she's pissed. Congrats. Page 82, 8.21, August 21st, 2019. From Jorge to owner, I love you, my friend, my love, my queen, my everything. Judge, will we approach you Yes. So after listening to all those insane text messages that Sarah sent to George and the rest of his family, after all of that, plus tons of other things that we don't even know about, George went back to Sarah, which is the reason Sarah was saying all these crazy things in the first place, because she knew it would work. And it did. This is the worst decision he ever made because it ended his life. I just don't understand what he saw in this woman. Members of the jury, thank you for your patience. I just have a short instruction to read to you. Members of the jury, the state showed you portions of what was entered into as State's Exhibit 21. It is not the entirety of State's Exhibit 21. The entirety of State's Exhibit 1 will go back to you into the deliberation room with a laptop for you to review all the exhibits and text messages uh, and the total conversations over and above what was highlighted by the state. With that state, do you have any other witnesses, evidence, or testimony to provide? Your Honor, at this time, the state rests its rebuttal case. Okay. Anything further from the defense? You want to approach? I just think we have some issues outside the presence of the jury. <clears throat> outside the presence of the jury. Need to okay. I have one thought, though, that requires a quick approach. Come on up. All right, members of the jury. We're going to go ahead and excuse you for a couple minutes. I got some things I have to discuss with counsel outside of your presence. Um, we'll bring you back in for additional instructions on where we think we're going to go after that. We'll bring you back in as promptly as possible. Thank you. Y'all can be seated. Thank you. The state has rested. Mr. Owens, um, do you have any intention on putting on a sir rebuttal in this case, sir? Okay. Yes, sir. Judge, um, we did not intend on a solar for the okay, thank you. All right, Ms. Boone, I've got a couple of questions to go over with you, ma'am. You were previously sworn this morning. Um, you've had the opportunity to review and participate in the trial. You've had the opportunity to review the rebuttal case as provided by the state. You've had the opportunity to review and listen to that evidence and witness any cross-examinations as, as it relates to the state's witnesses in their rebuttal case. Are you satisfied with your attorney's representation of you in this matter? Definitely. And are you still on board with the strategy that has been utilized in your defense? Yes. Now, your lawyers yesterday told the court that they may want to put on a sir rebuttal, which would be a limited rebuttal to the evidence presented by the state in their rebuttal, both yesterday and today. Your lawyers have indicated that they ha do not intend on doing that. Similar to other conversations we've had, ma'am, I don't want to know specifics. I just want to know if you and your lawyers have had these conversations. Have you had a conversation with your attorneys about putting on a sir rebuttal or a reply in response to the state's rebuttal? Yes. You had that conversation? Yes. Are you on board with the strategy employed by your lawyers that they are not seeking to put on a sir rebuttal in this case? I am. Okay. All right. Ms. Boone, at the conclusion of the state's presentation of State's Exhibit 21, uh, Mr. Owens had approached and had advised the court of some objections, specifically with regard to uh, the co-ownership or co-usage of the phone. The court is not permitted to comment on the evidence, and your lawyer was seeking an instruction from the court to advise our jury that both you and Mr. Torres had access to that cell phone. I am prohibited from commenting on the evidence. Now, that doesn't prevent your lawyer or the state from uh, speaking about that in their closing arguments. Just as a matter of law, I am not able to advise the jury as to what that evidence is. The second request pertained to uh, the state moving from place to place, to place uh, in uh, through those 108 pages, moving from timestamp to timestamp. The state chose to present uh, that evidence in that manner, which is why I gave that instruction to the jury that not the entirety of Exhibit 21 was provided to them, as to what the state produced, and they'll have to have the opportunity to review that in its entirety uh, when they go to deliberate. Do you have any questions about that so far? So far, no. Okay. The last portion, ma'am, pertained to the cadence or tone in which you and Mr. Torres communicated with each other. I have no knowledge as to how you and Mr. Torres communicated in text form as to what the tone was behind those words. 
Your lawyer advised me that there was an objection and you had some concerns as to the way Mr. J may have read those text messages to the jury. I found that the way that he read them was benign in a flat tone and did not exacerbate or excite any of the language that was in there. He had read them in as a monotone way as possible in presenting to the jury, and I didn't notice any changes in his cadence or heightening or lowering in the volume or tense or tone utilized in presenting that information to the jury. Do you have any other questions for me, ma'am? No. Anything else we need to address, Mr. Owens? No, sir. Anything else we need to address, State? No, sir. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and bring back in our jury. Yes, sir. I thank you. You all can be seated. Members of the jury, all the evidence and testimony sought to be provided by the state and the defense have been provided to us over the last week. At this point in time, the state and the defense and I need to discuss the law to be given to you in instructions. That's going to take a little bit of time. So we're going to go ahead and excuse you at this point in time for a longer lunch break than what you've had previously. All right, thank you very much. State, are you ready to proceed? Yes, Defense, are you ready to proceed? I'm ready, yes, sir. We're ready, Judge. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our jury. Everyone can be seated. Thank you. Members of the jury, we are at the conclusion of the evidence and testimony in this case. With that, State, you may proceed. This is a box. This is the box where George Torres was killed. It's a small box, 28 by 20 by 8 and 7 eighths inches. George Torres was zipped up in this box. George Torres took his last panicked breaths in this box. The medical examiner explained to us that with each breath George Torres took in, there was less oxygen in this box. George Torres was murdered in this box. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of myself, my trial partner, we thank you for your time and attention in this most important of trials. We now have the law from the judge in this case. This is what our duty is to follow. And let's have a discussion regarding that law that we've just been read and given. The first section of note we're going to come to is called Introduction to Homicide. But this being a legal document written by a bunch of lawyers who you've seen for the last two weeks arguing with each other, pay careful attention ands and ors. Remember, if an and is somewhere, we're going to need both things or all the things, and if an or is there, then only one of those things we're going to need. So, as we start out here on introduction to homicide, we come to the first section on justifiable homicide. And it reads, killing of a human being is justifiable homicide and lawful if necessarily done while resisting an attempt to murder or commit a felony upon the defendant or to commit a felony in any dwelling house in which the defendant was at the time. This section is completely inapplicable because George Torres <coughs> was zipped up in that suitcase. He couldn't commit or attempt to commit a murder on anybody. He couldn't even scratch his own head while he was in that suitcase. Next, we turn to excusable homicide. And it reads, the killing of a human being is excusable and therefore lawful under any one of the following three circumstances. When the killing is committed by accident, and the misfortune of doing any lawful act by lawful means, usual, ordinary caution, and without any unlawful intent. The problem in this circumstance for the defendant is that she took the law into her own hands. Her testimony was that when George Torres was in here, he was laughing and giggling and they were joking, and then he started to complain 
that he couldn't breathe. And that's when she said that she wanted him to stay in there so he could feel uncomfortable. So she could, he could feel her grievances. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not lawful. That is not the use of ordinary caution. And that is not applicable in this circumstance. Second, when the killing occurs by accident or misfortune in the heat of passion upon any sudden and sufficient provocation, George Torres couldn't provoke anything from his circumstance. George Torres was confined to this box. Next, when the killing is committed by accident and misfortune resulting from a sudden combat, dangerous weapon is not used, and the killing is not done in a cruel and unusual manner. Well, this fails on two counts. There was no sudden combat. In her words, this was laughing and joking, and we're all having fun, but she decides that it's going to get a little extra real for George Torres. And it fails on the second count, because George Torres was killed in a cruel and unusual manner. Next we turn to our main charge of the second degree. And the law informs us that to prove the crime of second degree murder, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. And I think it's important to stop right here. This sentence right here is telling us what has to be proven in order for the crime of second degree murder to be, uh, for the defendant to be found guilty in this case. We've been hearing all kinds of facts for almost two weeks now of trial. But these are the three facts that had to have been met by the reasonable doubt standard in order to be uh, found guilty. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that the state has proven second degree murder beyond all doubt. And the proof of that guilt is overwhelming. But I will cite for each element one fact that conclusively proves each of those elements beyond all doubt. As to the first fact that George Torres is dead, well, we have stipulation amongst other things that agrees to that. As to the second fact, the death was caused by Sarah Boone. Sarah Boone, in her own words, from the time that this case began on February 23rd, 2020, to when she took the witness stand a few days ago, was consistent about one statement. She zipped him up, she didn't zip him out. She zipped him up in the suitcase, and she refused to zip him out. Three, there was an unlawful killing of George Torres by an act imminently dangerous to another in demonstrating a depraved mind without regard for human life. The law goes on to define for us what a depraved mind is, and also what an act is. And it's going to tell us that an act includes any series of related actions arising from and performed pursuant to a single design or purpose. An act is imminently dangerous to another in demonstrating a depraved mind if it is an act or a series of acts that one, a person of ordinary judgment would know is reasonably certain to kill or do serious bodily harm to another, and is done from ill will, hatred, spite, or an evil intent, and is of such a nature that the act itself displays the indifference of human life. Ladies and gentlemen, her conduct fits every one of those things. And if there was a scintilla of doubt that this was not the actions of a depraved mind, I point to you, I-N-G-10-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0-0
62 and states 17. For everything you've done to me, Sallow. For everything you've done to me, Sallow. Fuck you. Sallow. <laughs> Fuck you. Sallow. Stupid. Sallow. This is my name. Don't wear it out. I can't fucking wait, babe. Seriously. Yeah, that's when you do. He shook me, Cheryl. And he has to do too well. You may continue. Real ransom. And I want to give it for it extra. Because <laughs> I got this. Sarah. Real ransom. Sarah. I can't believe it. Oh. That's what I feel like when you cheat on me. Sarah. Fuck you! Yeah. You should probably shut the fuck up. Ladies and gentlemen, that exhibit removes any scintilla of doubt about the depravity of the defendant's actions. But we know from the evidence that this was not the first time she had considered killing George Torres. We know from the evidence that on January 13, 2020, approximately one month prior to George Torres' murder, the defendant had a text message conversation. Please do something with yourself, Sarah. God bless you. And bless you and all of you, too. I'll get rid of him. Then I'll be better. Ugh. Torres. In this case, the law actually specifically tells us that the intent to cause death is not necessary. In order to convict of second-degree murder, it is not necessary for the state to prove that the defendant had an intent to cause death. So turning our attention towards voluntary intoxication, if there was any question about the fact that Sarah imbibed alcohol on the night that George Torres was murdered, and that maybe somehow that would excuse the conduct or be some type of defense for the conduct. Well, this tells us that that's not the case. 
Voluntary intoxication resulting from the use of alcohol is not a defense to a crime. Evidence of a defendant's voluntary intoxication may not be taken into consideration to show that she lacked the specific intent to commit any crime. A person is voluntarily intoxicated if he or she knowingly consumed a substance that he or she knew or should have known could cause intoxication. Voluntary intoxication is not a defense to second degree murder, manslaughter, or culpable negligence. Ladies and gentlemen, there's ample evidence of the defendant's intoxication from watching her on the public surveillance, buying the bottles of wine with George Torres, to her admissions to drinking, to her voice that we heard on the video while she was torturing George Torres. Next, we come to defenses. First, we come to the justifiable use of deadly force. And it tells us, it is a defense to the crimes of second-degree murder, manslaughter, and culpable negligence if the actions of Sarah Boone were justifiable use or threatened use of deadly force. Sarah Boone does not have the burden of proving that she was justified in using deadly force. Instead, for you to find Sarah Boone guilty, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Sarah Boone was not justified in using deadly force. The law on the justifiable use of deadly force is as follows. Sarah Boone was justified in using deadly force if she reasonably believed that such force was that such force or threat of force was necessary to prevent the imminent death or great bodily harm to herself. Sarah Boone had no duty to retreat. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments, Mr. Rowlings will rise. And he is going to show you this, and this, and this, and this as well. And he is going to talk about the list of grievances that Sarah Boone had for George Torres. She's going to he's going to talk to you about curtain rods. He's going to talk to you about black eyes. He's going to talk to you about what an awful, awful boyfriend George Torres was. And ladies and gentlemen, at the end of all of that, it still will not change the fact that the defendant is not entitled to the justifiable use of deadly force. Because as we continue to read this instruction, it tells us, in deciding whether Sarah Boone was justified in using the use of deadly force, you must consider the circumstances at the time the force or the threat of force was used. Danger need not have been actual. However, to justify the use of deadly force, the appearance of imminent danger must have been so real that Sarah Boone actually believed that deadly force was necessary. Moreover, to justify the use of deadly force, a reasonably cautious and prudent person under the same circumstances would have believed the use of deadly force was necessary. Ladies and gentlemen, no reasonably prudent and cautious person would believe that a man who could barely fit into this box, who was incapable of movement, who was begging for his life, who was slowly asphyxiating, suffocating with each breath, would have needed to use deadly force against him. The justifiable use of deadly force utterly fails utterly crashes like a house of cards. But there's more. However, 
the use of deadly force is not justified if you find that Sarah Boone used force to initially provoke threatened use of force against herself. Let's stop there before we consider the next two paragraphs. Some of the most critical testimony in this trial is her testimony on the stand. It was a great day. We were doing puzzles, and artwork, dancing with the dogs, listening to music. Tag, you're it. Hide and go seat time. George gets into the suitcase. She comes and zips him up. They were still laughing about it. We're still laughing after he zipped up in the suitcase. And then that's when George had the temerity to ask, George Torres had the temerity to ask, to be unzipped from the suitcase. And that's when Sarah Moon decided he needed to suffer. She was the initial aggressor, ladies and gentlemen. She provoked the use of force in this case. In her own words, we were laughing and playing right before he wanted to be let out because he couldn't breathe. The threat of force asserted toward the defendant was so great that she reasonably believed that she was in imminent danger of death or great bodily harm and had exhausted every reasonable means to escape the danger other than using deadly force on George Torres. He couldn't exert anything, ladies and gentlemen. He couldn't, George Torres couldn't even exert his arm out of the suitcase. How on earth could he have exerted a force so great to justify his... Judge, I object. Approach. Objection overruled. This is of no help to the defendant. Second paragraph. In good faith, Sarah Boone withdrew from physical contact with George Torres and clearly indicated to George Torres that she wanted to withdraw and stop the use of deadly force. But George Torres continued or resumed the threatened use of deadly force. Ladies and gentlemen, George Torres never got a chance to do anything. George Torres never was able to mount any aggression towards the defendant. Therefore, this par paragraph is inapplicable. And the law tells us as well that physical contact in this case includes any restraint on George Torres's movements. The law also tells us, again, you find that Sarah Boone, because of prior threats or difficulties with George Torres, had reasonable grounds to believe that she was in danger of death or great bodily harm at the hands of George Torres, you could, may consider this fact in determining whether the actions of Sarah Boone were reasonable. Now we're going to get the battered, battered spouse syndrome in a moment, but again, I submit to you, this will be the opportunity for the defense to air grievances in regards to George Torres. But again, those grievances will not change the law, and they will not change the fact that the justifiable use of deadly force fails as a defense for the defendant. If you find that at the time of the alleged second degree murder, manslaughter, culpable negligence, Sarah Boone knew that George Torres had committed an act or acts of violence, you may consider that fact in determining whether Sarah Boone reasonably believed it was necessary for her to use deadly force. Considering the issue of deadly force, you may take into account the relative physical abilities and capacities of Sarah Boone and George Torres. Now we come special instruction on battered spouse. You have heard evidence 
that Sarah Boone suffered from battered spouse syndrome. If you find Sarah Boone suffered from battered spouse syndrome credible, you may consider this evidence to assist you in determining whether in Sarah Boone's circumstances would reasonably believe that such force was necessary to defend herself against the imminent use of unlawful force by George Torres. Like other witnesses, you may believe or disbelieve all or any part of the testimony in regards to battered spouse. Ladies and gentlemen, we heard from three experts in the areas of battered spouse in this case. And I think at the outset, it's important to note what battered spouse is and isn't and what the law instructs us here. Battered spouse is not some carte blanche. Battered spouse is not a license to kill. The fact that George Torres, at points, mistreated Sarah Boone, did things that were worthy enough to get him arrested, to get restraining orders placed upon him, doesn't mean that she walks around with an ace in her pocket when it comes to George Torres. It doesn't mean that because he did these awful bad things, that now through the rest of time she's a battered spouse and she just has the right to kill him or to make him suffer or to punish him or to make him feel uncomfortable or decide that he needs to be confined to a box. No. What the battered spouse syndrome instruction does is it talks about the imminency of fear. And when we heard about that testimony, we, we heard about it from Dr. Harper, and we heard about it from Dr. Brandon for the defense. And some of the testimony was a little difficult to understand at points, but there was one point in Dr. Brandon's testimony that was very critical. Dr. Brandon talked about rule-outs. He talked about the fact that when emotions and emotional reactions are involved, like trauma and trauma-based disorders, other possibilities have to be ruled out before we can even ascribe those actions to battered spouse syndrome. Other possibilities, according to Dr. Brandon, include alcohol abuse. Dr. Harper should have listened to Dr. Brandon's testimony because Dr. Brandon completely undercut Dr. Harper's testimony. Dr. Harper relied heavily on the words of the defendant who was abusing alcohol at the time of these events. And then you heard from the expert for the state, Tanya Warner. In her opinion, was much more straightforward. Remember, Dr. Brandon did not render an opinion as to whether or not she suffered from battered spouse. Dr. Warner said affirmatively, yes, I believe she did suffer from battered spouse syndrome. But she also applied what Dr. Brandon was talking about. Other possibilities have to be ruled out as the trigger for a behavior, for an event. So, in Dr. Warner's estimation, the fact that at the time of this incident, they were laughing and joking and carrying on, meant that the trigger was not 
domestic violence or some threat. In the defendant's own words, the trigger was him wanting to get out and her being reminded of the bad things that he had done to her. That's not imminence of fear. That's reminder of bad things a person has done. And again, even if you were to believe that she was battered spouse triggered at the time of this event, it still does not save the day. Because all the battered spouse trigger law tells us is that it goes to that imminency requirement. It doesn't say there's no imminency requirement. It doesn't say that, look, if you're suffering from battered spouse and you're triggered by battered spouse, then, hey, there's no more imminency requirement. Do as you wish. It just gives the ladies and gentlemen of the jury another thing to consider in determining whether or not that threat was imminent. And we know from the evidence, we know from the videos, there was absolutely no threat. And we know there was no threat because George Torres never got out of that box. He was never got out of that box until sometime on the early afternoon of February 24th. Mr. J, can you please publish from stage 21? Tell the judge, listen, my fiance has nothing to do with this. It's all my fault. We were both taken and got out of hand. It's an isolated situation. It has never happened before. I love my fiance. She's a good woman. For being in trouble in her life, she has a seven year old son that she loves and cherishes. A blind Boston Terrier. She has two dogs. One is blind, one is dead. She goes around and she's driving and sees an animal that's injured. She'll stop in the middle of the street, no matter what kind of traffic it is, just to make sure that that animal doesn't get injured any more than where it already has. We both love each other, we both live together. Yes, every relationship has their arguments, but we are not type of people that you guys are portraying us to be. She especially. Especially her. So please, if you can, dismiss, dismiss this case. Close. Drop it. She is not the type of person. Good person. Great person. Angel. I know she'd be an angel. She's close to it. Best thing that has ever happened to you. Yes, ma'am. I love you to death. And I hate that we're going through this right now. Sonic. What? And they could. And they could. I love you. Where are you from? God will prevail and will take us out of this situation. Clearly, George Torres is dominating the defendant. Clearly, George Torres is the one telling the defendant what to do. Clearly, George Torres is the one calling the shots at 4748 France Lane. Ladies and gentlemen, are we so sure that George Torres wasn't the person suffering from battered spouse syndrome? Next, we're going to come to the justifiable use of non-deadly force. The language and the arguments are pretty close to what we've already heard 
in the deadly force instruction, including the key language that it requires a reasonably cautious and prudent person under the same circumstances would have believed that the use of non-deadly force was necessary. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that this was not a case of non-deadly force. George Torres lost his life as a result of these actions. We have heard the testimony of Dr. Sarah Zadovich, who described his cause and manner of death, who described the mechanism of death, how that oxygen dissipated in that suitcase. When we also look at the imminency, we heard in opening statements by Mr. Owens that, oh, the, the big threat in this case, the awful threat, was in the magic nine minutes between the video at 11.12 that she took torturing George Torres to her follow-up video at 11.23 after she had moved the suitcase. Mr. J, that you publish from State 17, IMG 1063. Uh -huh. It was a short video. Well, what's one of the things that we notice by this point? You can hear how loud George's voice is on the 11-12 video. But now, roughly 11 minutes later, from the time that that started, you see that the makeshift coffin that he's in has been moved, and his voice now is softer. The life is draining from George Torres, and it's evident in that video. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is evidence that there was no threat in the magic nine minutes that was not recorded. There was only George Torres in this box, slowly being killed. Next, we come to weighing the evidence. This instruction tells us it is up to you to decide what evidence is reliable. You should use your common sense in deciding which is the best evidence and which evidence should not be relied upon in considering your verdict. You may find some of the evidence not reliable or less reliable than other evidence. You should consider how the witness acted as well as what they said. Some things you should consider. Did the witness have an opportunity to see and know the things about which the witness testified. In focusing on the defendant, absolutely. Two people walked through the front door on the evening of February 23rd, 2020 at 4748 France Court. George Torres and Sarah Boone. But only Sarah Boone ever walked out of that front door alive. Did the witness seem to have an accurate memory? This is an emphatic no, and the litany of her intoxication in versions of events is evidence of that. Was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? I would submit to you she wasn't. Four, did the witness have some case, some interest in how the case should be decided? Clearly, does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony and other evidence in the case? And I would say largely no, because on the issue of whether or not George Torres could have threatened her, 
the way she says that he did? The answer is clearly no, and we know that from the forensic data. We know that from the items itself. Did the witness at some other time make a statement that is inconsistent with the testimony he or she gave in court? In regards to the defendant, it's almost more appropriate to ask about the time she did make a consistent statement. You listen to her version of events on the 911 call, on the body cameras, on her first interviews with law enforcement, and then you hear her in her next interview the next day with Detective Copsell and Detective Lowen, and more details come out, things change. First, she was never intoxicated, then she was intoxicated. Then there's just the whole fact of she omits the fact of, oh yeah, he was actually trying to attack me. Oh yeah, I was in fear for my life. When she said at every turn, no, it was just a great day. We were having fun. Oh my God, I can't believe this. We were doing good. The only stress we had was about jobs. And now, four and a half years after the fact, it's time to come up with a new story. But ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that the truth does not change. The facts do not change. The videos do not change. And on any version of events that the defendant has given, they all add up to the fact that there is absolutely no doubt that she is guilty of murder. I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, do you have any doubt about the defendant's guilt when she described using that baseball bat to hit George Torres's fingers back in the suitcase when he attempted to save his life? Do you have any doubt? when she is given how many versions of events in this case? Do you have any doubt after hearing the testimony of her neighbors about the loud crash and the arguing that night? Do you have any doubt after hearing the testimony of Dr. Sarah Zadovich? Do you have any doubt after watching the videos of George Torres being murdered and her laughing about it and talking about the fact that he cheated on her. Do you have any doubt after reading the text messages from her phone, after seeing the videos of how she controlled and manipulated George Torres? And if you say, Mr. Cacciatore, I still have a doubt. Well, then the law asks you, is that doubt to an element? And is that doubt a mere possible doubt? A speculative? An imaginary? Or a forced doubt? I submit to you the idea that she had to do this because she was a battered spouse is an imaginary doubt. It's an, a doubt born from the imagination of Sarah Boone. It is not a reasonable doubt. But if you find yourself back in that deliberation room and you are just trying to think of some way, some way in which the defendant is not guilty. Just searching, struggling for that way. That also is not a reasonable doubt, ladies and gentlemen. That is a forced doubt. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm confident that when you read the entirety of those jury instructions and apply the law to the facts that came out 
in this case, that you are going to come back with the only lawful verdict, which is guilty as charged, second degree murder. Thank you. Members of the jury, it is 4.04. As I promised, we were going to take that afternoon break before the defense proceeds with their closing argument. We'll bring it back in in about 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Y'all may be seated. Thank you. Okay, may proceed. Sarah Boone's entitled to a fair trial. I think um, that right's been compromised. Here today. Um, I, don't, I don't know who's scheduled to put the two detectives on the front row with the Torres family, who the, the family of the victim. But they had to have known to tell them that the suitcase video, which has been around for four and a half years, was going to be played during opening statement. And the state attorney's office or the sheriff's department had to advise them, or the victim's advocate had to advise them, that if they couldn't take it in front of a jury that's trying to decide the case, they needed to get out of the courtroom. Now, what happened here today should not ever happen. There should be safeguards in place. There's no room for this after two weeks of murder trial for something like that to happen. One of the Torres members of the family audibly during the two-minute suitcase video, express some kind of emotional reaction. I look back, she was, he or she were bent over in agony, physical pain. The physical pain followed the audible announcement. You can't unring that bell. That's their responsibility to ensure that kind of thing doesn't happen, especially when they know they're going to show a video and the family of the victim is on the front row. I've never heard of such. I asked for a mistrial. I move for a bad court thingy. I've never heard of such a request. Um, the victim's family has the right to be here. They were advised as to what will be used during closing arguments. I cannot make a decision for the victim's family and the homicide survivors as to whether or not they believe they can handle it. She clearly, or he, I don't know, couldn't, and I believe the appropriate thing was done, they left the court. Um, but again, to, to say this is intentional sabotage and all the accusations that continuously get made are unsubstantiated. And it does not warrant a mistrial. You can get warned, and sometimes they just judge their own emotions. I don't understand what test we are expected to run on homicide survivors. So the motion should be denied. Motion's denied. Denied! All right, let's bring back in our panel. Thank you. Y'all may be seated. Members of the jury, at this time, the defense is going to proceed with their closing argument, similar to the state's closing argument. Uh, these are not evidence. These are just arguments, and I ask you to pay attention to them. Thank you. Mr. Owens, you may proceed, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Y'all know me, I'm James Owens, along with Tony Henderson and the girls. We're all from Milton. I, I think y'all figured that out, that we were from out of town. Santa Rosa County, uh, northwest Florida, close to Pensacola. And my buddy Kevin Beck, he's a longtime friend, he's from New Mexico. Um, the team, the defense team, uh, is here, and uh, we're here to represent Ms. Sarah Bowen. And we feel confident that uh, we're going to be able to show you why she's not here. Okay? And I'm going to take my time. I've got some notes. I'm not the most organized person in the world. I've got some exhibits that we're going to show you. And then we got a couple of videos at the end. Okay? And uh, we're going to try our best to help you make the right decision, okay? But yeah, Milton's a small town. Objection. Problem is. Overruled. See how small it is. Seven miles away is another small town called Pace. In between that is a Walmart. It's a very small town. We didn't know what to expect coming down here to Orlando. Problem Judge, I'm allowed to... I'll give, you a, I'll give you a little bit more for intro, but then we need to get into it. 
I, I'm going to get into it, but I wanted to say. It's a small town, good people. We've been down here three weeks. We didn't know what to expect. We've been surprised. From Objection. In my argument. Mr. Owens, approach. Objections overruled. All, all I wanted to say is just since we've been here, we've been treated with respect and hospitality, and just like we've been at home. We appreciate that. Now, um, I'm going to do some reading, and then I'm going to do some talking. But <clears throat> ultimately, this is about uh, justifiable use of force. That is a legal defense in Florida. We as citizens, um, the law is designed to protect us from defending ourselves, to protect us from a potential attack. And you are the only ones, in this case, because Seraphim was arrested, that's going to be able to look at it critically and objectively. Objectively. Not like the state attorney. Objection. Overruled. Objectively. And the law in Florida gives you all the power and authority to do that. The state attorney can't make the decision. They can't make the decision. They can try to influence you. And we're going to talk about some of the things they did here in this trial. And some of the things they said. Objection. Yes. You may proceed. Objections overruled. <clears throat> Thank you, Judge. They've got their side, their position, we've got our side. So we're going to talk about that. But, um, and we're going to talk about justifiable use of deadly force and non-deadly force, but either way, however you rule, it still justifies her behavior, um, and the result is not good. Now, I don't believe there's anybody... Objection? Proper argument? Overruled. Objection? Reproach? Yes. I think you would find, from considering the evidence in this case that there is no doubt that Sarah Boone is a victim, that Sarah Boone has been traumatized, that Sarah Boone is still traumatized. And the reason for the trauma is George Torrance. From the positive things about the man that we've seen on video, to the positive things Sarah Boone has testified about, to the violent monster he becomes, and I mean monster, because it was repeatedly. And what happens the next day? Man, I don't remember. I was drunk. I don't remember. That's the gaslighting. That this young woman, vulnerable woman with nobody, just starving for love, starving for attention, and seeing the good of the man. And it was good. But every day was on the balance. She measured every day, depending on how it started and then how it ended. And that's the way she had to live her life, day in and day out. Day in and day out. Dr. Harper and Dr. Brandon talked about trauma. Dr. Harper spoke of the veterans that she had treated for post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't know if you remember her testimony, but she spoke about some of the veterans that had been in a war in Iraq. People in war a lot of times get post-traumatic stress. It used to be called shell shock and other things. But people in wartime or police officers Police officers will get post-traumatic stress. And a lot of them come in, the males come in, and just provide, oh, I'm all right. That's why Dr. Harper was talking about the veterans. That's what they'll do. But you've got to spend time with them. It just can't be one session. And you've got to run post-traumatic stress testing, which tells whether they really have post-traumatic stress. And we all probably have experienced some trauma. All of us have lost some loved ones. And, and it's, it's awful. You're in shock. You can't believe it. It's disbelief. You don't sleep for days. And eventually, you have to go back to work. You take a week off. Life has to go on. You get a little time, right? Time heals, right? These veterans that come back from a deployment, they get back. They get some semblance of normalcy. They may or may not get some treatment, but time helps. Time heals. Everybody. It helps. Just time. Overcoming a divorce. Overcoming a death, whatever trauma. Sarah Boone had no break. Learned helplessness. Just giving up. I can't, I can't get out of this situation. They broke up. She go about two days. Jackson is calling. Just learned helplessness. And it's 
you know, in the, the manual. Battered spouse syndrome is not, but what did you hear Dr. Harper say? She suffers from post-traumatic stress. That is a mental disorder. You are actually undergoing the psychological effects of post-traumatic stress. You're not in your right mind, and it's repeating itself. And when you look at this law, that's what you have to apply. Someone in Sarah Boone's shoes, when you're deciding whether her conduct was reasonable. Sarah Boone's long-term exposure to abuse created a state of learned helplessness and diminished her capacity to assess risk, especially in moments of heightened stress. The cyclical nature of this violence, the tension building, the battering, the contrition phases, caused Sarah to be trapped psychologically in that relationship. Due to this clear abuse, Sarah Boone had a reasonable belief of imminent harm under her state of mind. George Torres had a history of violence against Sarah, and as a result, Sarah Boone's actions were the result of fear conditioned by abuse she endured over time. The cumulative effects of long-term abuse, as we saw her behavior on the two-minute suitcase video, is a trauma response. Sarah Boone acted out of a sense of preservation. While tragic, it was not driven by malice, but a mind ravaged by abuse. And I'm going to ask you to try to understand. Sarah Moon being emotionally and psychologically broken. His actions may have been misguided attempts at survival but not murder. Imminent danger, her response reacted to that belief. It's somebody suffering from the long-term psychological effects of domestic violence. Who spent a lot of time? Dr. Brandon, you remember him. He was the first expert on trauma. Kevin Beck, you remember, did the direct examination of Dr. Brandon. He was from down in Miami, I think. He talked about the trauma that you, can't, you cannot escape from, from the abuse so you develop coping skills to protect yourself knowing that the bad things will happen to me. It changes your behavior, not only your behavior, but your thinking, your subjective thinking about fear and what to do. And if you remember, Dr. Brandon said it's all about that person's perception, okay? A lot of times they will self-medicate with alcohol or drugs. A lot of times they suffer from anxiety. Basically, he said the trauma ends up being terror because you do not know what to expect. You do not know what is going to happen that night. It may be a great night. You may drink, and both of you have a great time. He falls asleep, passes out, you fall asleep, passes But it may turn by depending on his mood, I don't know if you can tell, she would try to placate him. Dr. Brandon said, you know, when you're trying to evaluate somebody, it takes time to get them to trust you. And ultimate, the ultimate goal, he said, is to be a behavioral detective. If you're a forensic uh, psychologist, is to be a uh, behavioral detective. And the ultimate goal is to put yourself in the abused person's eyes so you can better understand their world. Their perception of danger is what you have to look at. What a reasonable person would do under their perception of danger. Trauma experts explain how victims' reactions to, in moments of stress are the product of the damaged psyche. Her actions, although tragic, and it was a tragedy, George Torres lost his life in that suitcase. It's a reactionary response to sustained trauma. It's, it's as if Sarah was acting out of a deeply ingrained fear and helplessness de developed over the years. So it's, it's a desperate, desperate need for survival, but battered women do things to keep the peace from time to time. And when they feel like they have a small portion of momentary power, they may enjoy that by vocalizing their position to the abuser. Sarah Boone's not perfect. Sarah Boone would argue with him, talk down to him. Some would say was somewhat abusive to him. Sarah's not charged with that. Sarah Boone is not charged with that. And I want to, I want to read you something. Okay, I don't, I don't know where it's at, but I'm going to have to come back to it. But essentially what it said was, essentially what it said was eventually, it's been a two-week trial, I've got a bunch of notes. I'm trying to get this one. I know, I know it's important. Um, what I wanted to say was someone can be mean and angry and hateful and intoxicated and still be abused. They're not mutually exclusive. A mutual abuse exists where one is abusive towards another. And eventually the victim, Sarah Boone, trying to fight back against the abuse, became verbally abusive. 
While the victim has committed verbal abuse, it is important to remember that they, Sarah Boone, are the victim and have been pulled into an extremely vicious cycle where they are trying to survive. Sarah Boone intentionally left George Torres in the suitcase. What's the, what's the act of a battered spouse syndrome woman? She went up to her room, she fell asleep, and passed out. These actions are disconnected. Ultimately, she didn't let him out because of her fear that she knew if he got out in that moment, what he would do. That's real fear, that's real trauma that she was experiencing at that time. Now, I talked to you about force being used. And I, talked to, I think I talked to you about uh, blocking an attack uh, using a physical restraint like the suitcase to block somebody's attack. And the example I give, I've got a couple of examples that may or may not apply. Let's say you're in a bar and you've got your buddies and the other guy's got the buddies and they're drinking and there's, there, it ends up being an argument between two of them. And you realize that these two are fixing to get in it. Well, one of your buddies comes around on the other side and grabs the guy before he's able to strike him, right? So you're committing an offense on this guy, but it's a, it's a restraint. It's a restraint. Are you grabbing by the neck and try to get him out the bar? So yeah, you're committing an act, but it's designed to defend another, which is legal. Or let's say you have a situation where you have a police officer and he's on patrol. You know, he's in uniform, he's wearing a firearm, and of course he's got the bulletproof vest. And he's called, he's, he goes to a call where there's a suspect that may be armed. And so he gets there, he gets out of the squad car, and he's walking around. Of course, he's taking out his gun because he realizes he may be armed. And eventually he sees the suspect, and the suspect reaches for his waist. Now, in that moment in time, that officer has to make a decision. Am I going home with my family tonight? And I, I asked Dr. Warner about this bas Vaseline thing that he's called the fear response or fight or flight. You know, those decisions are made, it, it's instinctive, based on your set of circumstances. She instinctively reacted to her unique set of circumstances to save her life. Or save herself from another one of these. I'm 63. I can't imagine. Her father's not around. I need to talk about the case. Please. And if you'll remember, I'll get back. I'll get back. Here. If you'll remember, um, let's start. Let's start with the witnesses, and then I'll talk about Sid. But the first witness out of the box for the state. If you remember, it was Juan Torres, the brother. Remember that? It was, it was some time ago. No, it's been a while. Y'all taking notes. You may have to go back. Their first witness was a good witness for us. Their first witness in their prosecution of Sarah Boone for murder was a good witness for us. Remember Tony Henderson with the cross examine of Juan Torres. Asked him, what did you hear Sarah Boone say? Juan Torres, she was yelling, he's been choking me. Mr. Henderson said, did that surprise you? Juan Torres said, no. That family knew what was going on. The police knew what was going on. The neighbors knew what was going on. Pearl Walker came in here, 80-something years old, in a wheelchair. Kevin Beck called her up. She saw it. Is there any doubt? I tell you why there's no doubt. In cross-examination, I got Dr. Warner to even admit. Did you hear it? Yes. Okay, Mr. Old, she suffers from battered spouse syndrome. Wouldn't have been it on direct. Well, maybe. I don't, I don't really know. I hadn't had enough time to really see her. You hadn't seen the pictures? You hadn't seen the two-minute video? You've seen her one time earlier this month. One time. And she's going to start testifying about stuff she's never said before until she showed up in court? About, well, based on what she told me, I don't think she was an intimate fear? Come on. This is a courtroom. Good thing y'all are here. We well, thank you. It gets even worse than that here in this courtroom. The state attorney referred to these pictures. I was going to rise up yeah. and show these pictures to you. Overall, you may proceed. And I was going to rise up and show these pictures to you. Well, yeah, I'm going to do that. They put her on trial for murder. But what did they say? 
Maybe George Torres is the battered spouse. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? Now you know why we're here. Now you know why we're here. Little boys learn early on that girls are different. You do not put your hands on a girl. You can't wrestle with them. You can't punch them. You can't kick them. You can't treat women that way. When you become adults, I don't care what she does to you. I don't care what she says to you. If she gets in your face, whatever she does, you do not have a right to hit a woman. No, sir. What has the state attorney tried to do? Objection. Proper argument. Sustained. What has they done? Objection. What evidence have they, what evidence have they tried to put on? Overall. What evidence have they tried to paint Sarah? Sarah S. Controlled and manipulated were the words they used. You know, this ain't the 1900s. This is 2024. What's all these text messages? Why is that relevant? What are they trying to claim? She provoked his violence? Isn't that what they've done here? In this trial? Sustained. Abraham Marino changed his statement. They took a statement from Abraham Marino in which Sarah stated, I don't know if you remember, but it was when the police were all there. Uh, I think they got the tape out and, and some neighbors were coming around and there were two or three neighbors sitting around. She, he said Sarah came out and stated it was an accident. Abraham Marino knew uh, George Torres from Philly. Okay. They were friends. They would talk either at the complex or if Marino went to Paul Ace Hardware or Ace Hardware went to Paul, the state attorney notifies. Judge, I'm going to object to reading from things that are not in evidence. Approach. Marino says, all I heard Sarah say that afternoon was it was an accident. Then he came in here today, or this week, and said, no, she said, I was teaching him a lesson, things got out of hand, and then I fell asleep. Four and a half years later, we know he's friends with the toilet. We heard it here. Now, I want to talk to you about the, uh, the two boys that live right next door. Um, you remember... Um, Vincent, Vincent Battaglia, and um, Brandon Motes. Remember those guys? And you remember it came out in the testimony, you know, this event happened on February 23rd of 2020. But it came out in the testimony that Sarah had said, George Torres, the night before, February 22nd of 2020, grabbed me by my hair, and pulled me down the, sta the stairs in my apartment from top to bottom, which is consistent with what they were saying happened, remember? But they got their dates wrong. And remember Mr. Henderson called Deputy Copsel, or Detective Copsel up in our case, and she had to say, yeah, I didn't take their two statements until the 27th, February the 27th, remember? So they're remembering back, and they both had similar stories. Of course, they had time to talk by then, the 27th. I think the only recorded interviews they got that the night of this event, February 23rd, was from Sarah Boone and her ex-husband, Brian Boone, right? So they came back following up on the 27th. That's when they got a, a statement from Brandon Motes and Vincent Battaglia. And at that time, they said, yeah, we heard that sound. You remember Sarah testifying? No, that was the night before. I had complained about that, and I think one of them had testified. Yes, she had said something about being drugged down the night before. It may have been, I uh, can't remember now who it was, one of them. And, you know, it looked like that there may be some implication. Sarah got him in the suitcase and pushed him down the stairs. But I think we didn't hear anything more of that. Remember? And then this photograph, which we introduced, which shows the bottom of the stairs, as you can see, there's uh, Lucas's bookshelf right here. This is where Sarah stored, Sarah Ben stored Lucas's stuff. And you can see it's not disturbed at all. I want to get back to Sarah, and I want to talk a little bit about that. But let me talk a little bit about the law. Unjustifiable use of force is legal and lawful if you reasonably believe, and I think we all probably all already understand it by now, you reasonably believe it was necessary to prevent imminent threat to harm. The law is crucial, ensuring that individuals can safeguard themselves in potentially dangerous situations.
by acknowledging you have a right to defend yourself when you have a reasonable belief that force is necessary to prevent an attack. Okay? What did Mr. Henderson say in jury selection? You don't have to wait. You do not have to wait. If you're facing, in your mind, a reasonable, imminent threat, you don't have to wait. Let's talk about Sarah Boone and this unconventional form of physical restraint to block the attack of George Torres. What did she say? Assault. Assault. You've got to think about that. You have to think about what was going on. You've got to think about the trauma she was undergoing. You've got to think about they both been drinking. And you've got to think about the fact that it was all fun and games for a while. And I think the biggest thing to know is that George Torres chose to get into the He's a grown man. That was his choice. She didn't force him in at gunpoint to get into that suitcase. He voluntarily got into that suitcase because they were drunk and being silly and stupid and playing hide and seek, which I guess when you get so drunk, that, that seemed like a good thing. Zipped him up, they're laughing, carrying on. And as you know, Sarah likes to videotape a lot. And I know you've seen some of these videos and you're wondering why, but I think the evidence shows that when George is being videotaped, he's not going to do anything. If you think about that, when George is being videotaped, that's like her power. You know, um, Dr. Harper said that uh, Sarah's words are her power. Sarah's words are her power. Physically, she's no match for George. But that's her power, with her words. When she gets a chance to have some control, that's what she does. And she videotapes, because she knows when she's videotaping, she can tell, tell it like it is. I can tell him what I want to tell him. A couple of these videos you've seen where she's telling him what I did. But she's got that video camera on and George knows he's being video. We've got one that we will show you a little bit before he loses it. But they're kidding around, playing around. Then, you know, Sarah realizes, okay, this is my chance to say something to him. So she sits down, she turns on the phone, and you've seen the tape. For everything you've done to me are the first words out of Sarah's mouth when the video begins. There's a lot packed into those words. Think about that. For everything you've done to me, this is how it feels when you choke me. Now that's that's in direct response and the result of the abuse that she has suffered at the hands of George Thorne. She wants him, for that moment, to feel how she feels. She wants, for that moment, to feel. For him to feel how she feels. How uncomfortable, the lack of control that she feels. When George is violent with her, just for a moment, she won't be able to feel it. And if you can imagine... Change the building rule. Approach. I think from the evidence, you can determine she, she was crazy about it. She was crazy about it. And I don't know if, you know, of course, it's a syndrome. But she felt like she couldn't do without it. And let's say she videotapes it, and then it's turned off. And there's a nine-minute gap, 11-minute gap, whatever it is. I said 11, they're saying 9, but I think if you count two of the other ones, it's not. But there's 9 minutes that we don't have video. But what did Sarah say? Now, if you remember when you listen on that video, George is talking in a normal voice. He's not stressed. Of course, if you're talking, you can breathe. She had said she had some air. And of course, she doesn't realize the situation that it's going to end the way it ends. So she has no appreciation of, of that. It's a canvas, it's an old, she knows, an old canvas suitcase that she's got the, the, the two zippers removed or spread out a little bit so he can bring. So she thinks he's not being serious. But eventually he gets angry. She gets angry, he gets angry. He sends words to her and then his hand starts to come out of the suitcase. She also said his tone changed. And I know everybody's got a cadence with their spouse or boyfriend, girlfriend, but you know what I'm talking about. We've got a way of talking to people. Uh, we've got a way, your wife, your husband, you just you, you know each other. You know when they come in from work, what kind of mood they're in. 
just by a couple of things the way you just sense it, right? Well, especially somebody as hypervigilant as Sarah and as hypervigilant as a battered spouse woman would realize that he can flip the switch at any time. When I get out of here, I'm going to end you. And he realizes he's getting out. He got his hand out. At that moment in time, in Sarah's mind, that's an imminent threat. So she's got a justifiable right to use force. What did she do? She went over there and grabbed it. She lifted it up. She tried to get his hand back in. Remember? She tried to get his hand to go back in. Wouldn't go back in. So his, her son's back was three feet away. Where the police found it the next morning. Same spot. No attempts to hide. No attempts to delete the phone. No attempts to tamper with evidence. Nothing. In the same spot as it was. She picks up the bat. She pokes. She pokes him hard. Trying to get him to stop trying to get out. And eventually he does. And you've seen the blunt force injuries. And you saw some of the circular injuries where you can tell there's a poking that gets right around here. And she poked him several times. You remember the pathologist said, I think, maybe five, six, or seven times. She pokes him. And he's got some scratches. I don't know if they'll let you look at it, but uh, on the back of that suitcase, it's got some bars, some metal bars that are, that are inside the lining. There's some lining. Uh, and it's for support when you walk in. She testified. You heard what she said. That she was justified. That's uncontroverted testimony. Let's let's talk about the jury instructions just for a minute. I want to talk? I want to talk about reasonable doubt for a minute. Can't find the page, but we find it. I, I've got a book. I've got a book. If y'all are looking, I think it's on page fifteen and twenty-two. But we're going to talk about reasonable doubt in a minute. But if you look at those bottom three short paragraphs. It is the evidence introduced in this trial and the it alone that you are to look for the evidence or look for that proof. A reasonable doubt of, as to the guilt of the defendant may arise from the evidence itself, a conflict in the evidence, or lack of evidence. But here's the main thing. And, you know, Obviously, I represent her, and I'm trying my best to show you honestly and fairly the doubt in this case. Five reasonable doubts, 17 reasonable doubts, 25 reasonable doubts. You have to have one reasonable doubt. I'm trying to show you throughout the evidence that each one of you can have a different reasonable doubt. A difference, but one reasonable doubt about the state's case and your verdict is not guilty according to the law. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt does not mean proof beyond all doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible doubt, speculative doubt, or imaginary or forced doubt. Such a doubt must not influence you to return a verdict of not guilty if you have an abiding conviction of guilt. And this is a deeply held belief. You know, reasonable doubt is the highest standard we recognize in litigation. You know, a car wreck or something like that is preponderance of the evidence standard, 51% you're in time. Abiding conviction, that's a deeply held belief that you must have if you're thinking about something. That's a firm belief. That's a level of certainty that you would have. That's what you got to have as a jury. I've got to be certain of her guilt. If on the other hand, if after carefully considering, comparing, and weighing all the evidence, which we want you to do, there is not an abiding conviction of guilt. So I'm not certain. Or if you have a conviction, I think there's some evidence of guilt, but it is one that is not stable, one which wavers and vacillates, then the charge is not proved beyond a reasonable doubt. And you should find the defendant not guilty because the doubt is reasonable. You understand that? You've got to be certain of guilt. That's the high standard we've recognized. If you've got, I've got some evidence of guilt, so okay. There's some evidence for conviction, but it's not way, it, it's not stable. It wavers and vacillates. Then under our system, you've got a reasonable doubt. You've got the power and authority and the obligation under the law. If that's the way you feel, to vote that way. Later in the instruction, it goes on. It's up to you to decide what evidence is reliable. You should use your common sense in deciding which is the best evidence and which evidence should not be relied upon in considering your verdict. You may find some of the evidence not reliable or less reliable than other evidence. 
you may rely on your own conclusion about the credibility of a witness that is totally the province of the jury to decide that. A jury may believe or disbelieve any or all the part of the evidence or the testimony of any witness. I want, I want to show you this before I begin. But Dr. Warner said, this is their expert again, he testified that Sarah Boone suffers from battered spouse syndrome. Battered women's experiences affect her perception of imminent danger. Those past experiences with George Torres, and there's a bunch, affect their perception. Remember Dr. Brandon, uh, Michael Brandon talked about perception of imminent danger. Victims of repeat violence may fear death in situations others would not. The reason Sarah experiences all this, the reason she was feeling the way she was feeling, that imminent threat of danger from George was because of George Torres. George Torres is responsible for her mental state because of the way he has violently treated her. She reacted to his attempts to get out because of the way he treated her and the way he, she knows he, what is he going to do if he gets out of the suitcase? She knows. The second video is blank. She's flipped it back upside right. You hear him, it's 22 seconds. He says, Sarah, she's not going to open that suitcase. So he's already threatened her. She used the bat to get him to stop trying to get out of it. Why would she do that? Why would she do that? I know what he's going to do. I know what he's going to do to me. I know him like I know more. I know him more than he knows himself. I know what he's going to do to me. You don't have to wait. That was justifiable. You got to understand this. She intentionally used the bat to defend herself. She intentionally didn't unzip it to defend herself. Both of those are lawful under our law. She went upstairs. The dogs were upstairs. At some point, she called her husband, her ex husband, Brian Boone. We know that many times she testified, or somebody, somebody in court said she, she would often flee to her ex-husband's house sometimes. I, th I believe that testimony came out from either Sarah or somebody. That she, sometimes she would flee, or sometimes she would flee to upstairs. One of those two. But the dogs were up there. She made a phone call. At some point, she fell asleep. Passed out, fell asleep. We don't know. They had... Two big bottles of wine. That was unintentional. His death was unintentional. You remember when she was in the interrogation room? I don't know if we did a good job of this, but it came out that she got arrested. You remember the one time when she got the black eye? She got arrested for strangulation. And you, you, you remember that? It was They ended up over there by the dryer, and he was banging her back of her head on the, on the floor that had a very little carpet on it, and she ended up Get, getting her arms out, and then she grabbed his neck. And she eventually got him off of her, and that's when he got up and stomped her in the eye. Remember? Well, the police came for that event, and they took statement, and Sarah, Sarah was honest with the officers about what all, and they arrested her. Remember that? They arrested her. And she said, why? I was fighting back. So from that point on, she didn't trust law enforcement. No, actually, she filed a restraining order so she could continue to have George around. But if he pissed her off, all she had to do was call the police and they would arrest him with no question just because he was in the house. That doesn't sound like she didn't trust the police. It sounds more like she just figured out a better way to manipulate them. The video that they showed a while ago about George, that was about dropping the case where she was defending herself and fighting back. She didn't know the law. She's not a lawyer. She gets up the next morning. Brian's calling. Sarah's got to pick up Lucas at three. Brian's calling. Brian's calling. Brian's calling. Eventually she walks down. She's looking for George. Where's George? It's quiet down there. Then she looks in the bathroom. She looks out. He's smoking a cigarette. Is he on the computer? She sees the suitcase. And you can imagine. Injection, Sustained. She sees him in a suitcase. She panics. But what does she do? What does she do? She tries to get her fiancé out of the suitcase. They're engaged to be married. She's not trying to kill him. She gets him out. She tries to do... He's purple. 
She tries her best to do CPR. She doesn't. And you heard her. I don't know what. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know, call Brian. That's only. That's her safety valve. That's all she's got. Brian eventually says, "She's come over." He call, She calls again in two minutes. I'm on the way. He gets there. You got to call 911. May have told her before. Call 911. She calls 911. She tries to do CPR again. Is she busy trying to hide evidence? No. She's trying to save his life. If she can. So the police get there. She knows if she told him she fought back, she's going to be arrested. That's what happened before. What happened before? Like George said on the video, she'd never been arrested before. Before that time, she was charged with that with George. She lies. She's scared. She doesn't call a lawyer. Officer Rodriguez was the first to talk to her. There's a report statement there where she doesn't tell the whole story. She lies. And then the detectives eventually get there and get her in the squad car. You hear the audio. I think, I think it was played. She lies again. Then the next day, she goes down to the sheriff's department. Now, if they would have told her, hey, ma'am, we're going to arrest you, and she gets a lawyer to go down there to make a statement, and the lawyer would advise her. Objection. Facts on evidence. Sustained. Move strike. Stricken. The jury will pay no mention or give any weight to that statement. She's not a lawyer. She didn't have a lawyer present when she made those statements. She didn't know the law. She didn't know she was justified in defending herself the way she did in this dysfunctional, toxic, abusive relationship. I don't know if you remember, it was a two hour video, but there were some things she said, you know, not intentional. And eventually, she wanted the um, the detective. It was Detective Lowell, the male the male detective. And she said, "I, I swear to you on my son's life, it was not intentional. What she was talking about was that George passed. That was not intentional. She thought he was fine in there. Would he sober up? We've learned from their history. When Sarah gets drunk, she calls for help. When George gets drunk, he beats Sarah. That's their pattern." How many times did we see Sarah call the law? I think she said, I didn't know something like this could happen. I've never done it before. And Detective Lowen said, well, what did you expect that was going to happen? Sarah Boone didn't know that he could die in there. It's an old beat up canvas suitcase that she left a gap in. And as naive as that sounds, she didn't appreciate the danger. I mean, is that the way you want to kill somebody? Is that the way you're going to do it? She had Lucas to take care of. Am I going to go to prison doing it like this? No attempt to hide the gun. I think the evidence is clear. That's how this happened. Still, who got stabbed? Stabbed with a steak knife in the lip. And she stayed with him. Poked between the eyes with a curtain rod. Stalked in the eye. I mean, who does that? The law empowers an individual to defend their life and safety when faced with a threat and to prevent an attack. That's what Sarah Boone did. Sarah had to be the parent a lot of times. It was her place. She had that $1,000 a month from the um, divorce settlement coming in. She had the car. She had the phone. She had the keys. She had to be the parent in a lot of ways. You know, Dr. Harper is from Okaloosa County, which is up, up in the Panhandle, close to where we're from. You know, she, she talked about how important it is was to, to develop trust with the patient over a course of time. It's just going to take time when we have somebody suffering that kind of trauma and that kind of damaged psyche. It's going to take some time to get, to get them where they can trust you and really tell you and talk to you and tell you what's going on with them. I think her testimony... I don't think, but I think I think the evidence supports that her testimony was credible. Objection. The evidence supports that her testimony was Objection credible. Objection is sustained. I, I can't give my personal. Okay. The evidence the evidence supports that her testimony was credible because of the time that she stood, because of the number of tests that she did, that she diagnosed her with post traumatic stress disorder, alcohol use disorder. Um, think of anxiety disorder and battered spouse syndrome. Warner confirmed that. And, you know, Dr. Michael Brandon, the first witness, he was brought in as a subject matter expert. So he hadn't treated Sarah. He was just testifying about 
the condition. I've been doing it a long time. He's an expert at it. And that's to advise you. And as crazy as it sounds, in this syndrome, they, they, they try to protect the abuser. They're in love with them. They try to protect them. I don't know if you remember that there was a time Sarah Boone had a conversation with one of the neighbors and they were talking about something. She said, did you hear anything yet last night? I remember she said, shh. It's okay. Both George and Sarah lied to the police. They lied to medical people. It just comes with the syndrome. When Sarah gets beaten by George, she calls the police. And a lot of times she just wants him out. She doesn't want him to get in trouble. She just wants him out. There never was a report of George calling the police on Sarah. She wasn't physically abusing him. The state is trying to present evidence. It's the emotional right. abuse. Sustained. Strike. Stricken. Members of the jury will pay no attention to that comment. Give it no weight whatsoever. I believe the evidence that's been presented by the state is an attempt to show that Sarah mentally or emotionally abused George Torrance. Again, she's not charged with that. She's not perfect. Some of that was her trauma. In Sarah's situation, we do become numb and hardened, I think, over time. That's a coping mechanism. It's a day-to-day -day thing, some good days, some, you know. But the homicide detectives, I, I know if you saw that two-hour video, at some point during the two-hour video, they started talking about some of the violence. And they go, we know. We know. They had already checked with neighbors or whoever. They knew. The neighbors knew. The police officers knew who responded. Towards his family knew. They all knew about the abuse. Dr. Harper testified that abused women act differently when they perceive a threat. I think Sarah Boone was loyal to a fault to George, even through all the abuse. The prosecutor in opening statement, when he was talking about George Torres passing away, and his quote, quote was, because I wrote it down, George, in Sarah Boone's mind, George Torres deserved it. He deserved to die. She loved the man. She wasn't trying to kill him. He also commented about... Yes. The prosecutor said in Oakland about the violent episode. It's a bunch of violent nonsense. You'll have to make your mind up whether that's that. There were a couple of exhibits that I introduced late, and they were no-contact provisions, where there had been a court order from a judge, not only a verbal order, but it was reduced to writing. So there was a court order for George Torres not to have any contact with Sarah Boone. Okay. Court system got involved. They would have no contact with George Torres. And they talked about coercion, coercive control, power and control. We know about his abuse. We know he destroyed the home, the TV. We know about his jealousy. We know about how he treated her dogs. Nicely when he was sober, but at times, Abuse the dogs or threaten to do so. If you think about power and control, when you're controlling a person, and I think she testified that he kind of smothered her, it's always around her. Part of his fear was her realizing that she'd had enough, that she would get the strength over time if she had enough time away from him where she wasn't in control of it and he wasn't in control of it. She would come to her senses and realize she could do better. George Torres knew he was going to lose control. If she had a bunch of time away from him, she might move on. He was willing to violate a court order to maintain control. I want to show a couple of videos. I want to say something to you. Shelby Andrews is going to help me. If we could dim the lights. Yes. Do you understand? <clears throat> As of this moment, and until I can get you out, get the fuck out of here. I dare you. Did you see yes, what Look at it. Get away from me. Get away from me. Get away from me. I'm going to scream bloody murder. I'm going to scream bloody murder. Did you see him flip the switch? Or he lost it? Even though the video was gone. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to finish up right here. Sarah Boone, I've gotten to know. 
Objection. Proper argument. Sustained. Sarah Boone is like any other citizen. Equal justice under the law. She's to be treated like any other citizen. Fairly and impartially. Based on the circumstances she was facing at the time of this tragedy. Based on the battered spouse instruction, which is a special instruction that's given when women have a heightened sense of fear and trauma. That you're utilized in applying her subjective standard to the reasonable standard of what a reasonable person would do under her circumstances in using the force that she used to defend herself. I hope I haven't missed anything. I've tried my best. Sarah Boone fought back and survived. We ask that you do justice in this case and find her not guilty because the doubt is reasonable. I've tried to show you where the doubt was. I trust you, judgment. We spent a long time picking the jury four days. We trust you. We appreciate your service and your obligation to do your duty. You have the power and authority to right this wrong. That's what we're asking you to do. And give Sarah Boone some hope for a better life and freedom. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any rebuttal? Yes, sir. You may proceed. Ladies and gentlemen, George Torres is dead because the defendant believed he deserved to be zipped shut in a suitcase so that she could make him feel how she felt when he cheated on her, when he choked her, and to hold him there as a captive audience, according to her testimony. Now he has to listen to me. Well, right out of the gate, there are credibility issues. Cheating to me means viewing pornography. Well, we saw cheating really means women. And the heated conversation on June 14th about these women in Facebook, that is what leads to the arrest on June 15th. He's out pouring, candy crush, all the bizarre things that you see in her phone. He uses the legal system as a weapon at times. There's no denying that they are engaging in violent behavior. And it is over nonsense. It is smashing TVs. They call the police and then they're standing there looking bewildered about what to do and who to say and, and laughing and joking. The courtroom is the place for justice, not a suitcase. The reason we have a jury system originally started with the idea that the king, the crown in England, shouldn't be able to go and incarcerate citizens on his whim. So it developed into a system where citizens would have to say, yes, you can take our fellow citizen. But the opposite is also true. A citizen cannot take another citizen's life because he or she feels like it. That likewise requires a jury to decide that it was objectively reasonable for a person of ordinary prudence and caution. Like Mr. Cacciatore argued earlier, battered spouse syndrome is not a license to kill. Past grievances, even being stabbed in the leg, so on and so forth, do not give her the license to kill. There are still laws in place about when and how this can be done in a justifiable manner. I want to talk about the most important jury instruction in this case that has not been discussed very well or thoroughly. However, the use of deadly force is not justified if you find that Sarah Boone used force to initially provoke the threatened use of force against herself. And we'll stop at that comment. The facts of the case that came from her own mouth, if she is to be believed, and we will explore thoroughly, why you should disregard every bit of her testimony from court to the detectives to the 911 operator to the doctors. It comes a point in time where we're going to play hide and seek. And he says, tag, you're it. Even though she's it, she goes upstairs, hides in the shower. 
eventually gets tired of being there, it's cold, so on and so forth, and she comes back downstairs. And as she comes back downstairs, she can see Mr. Torres fiddling to place himself inside the suitcase to try and hide for this game. And the lid is not closed, and it's flapping. And out of jest, out of levity, undisputed according to her testimony, she comes over there and zips it shut. Whether it's 100% or enough for two fingers to get out, that is something that you decide as the jury. But there came a point in time where the fun and games was over. And Mr. Torres told her that. Babe, I can't breathe. Sarah, babe, let me out. This is all on video. We don't have to imagine this. This is all on video. One, one zero six two. At that point in time, she is using force against him that is not justified. She is the initial provocateur. She is the aggressor under the law. And what level of force is it? I can't breathe. Not let go of my hand. Not get your hands off me. I can't breathe. This is no different than two people, maybe their buddies at the bar, similar to an example that's given by Mr. Elm, who are wrestling, and one has another one in a headlock, and there comes a point in time where the person on the receiving end of the headlock says, I, you know, that's enough, I'm tapping. George Torres was tapping, and she ignored it. And she was kind enough to tell you why. Out of anger which translates to hatred, ill will, spite, just like that in jury instruction for second degree murder. She told you exactly why. She got angry. Him saying, I can't breathe, babe, was what triggered her. Not a fear of imminent harm. Those are his, her own words. That is the law. These are the two paragraphs that solve this equation without getting up on a big whiteboard in college that's 30 feet long, 15 feet high, and a ladder, and somebody's scribbling Latin words and Greek letters for months and months to solve this huge, complicated equation. The equation is solved in two paragraphs. She is the initial aggressor. He is saying, I can't breathe. It is no different than a naked chokehold that she does not let go of. And she told you it's because I want him to listen to me. This is my bully pulpit, pulpit. This is how he made me feel in the past. She doesn't describe it as teaching him a lesson, but that's exactly what she says. I want him to feel like I felt in the past. I want to tell him things. Ladies and gentlemen, we can play semantical games, but that is teaching him a lesson. Therefore, we have to look at the other two paragraphs. Because right now, plain as day, the use of deadly force is not justified if you find that Sarah Boone used force to initially provoke the threat and use of force against herself. And what force are we talking about? Well, the threat of force that she tells you she was facing was him fighting for survival. Him sticking his fingers out of the suitcase. Him sticking his hand out. That is the threat of force coupled with, I'm going to end you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, she is the initial provocateur. She is the one using deadly force against him. If I have somebody in a rear naked chokehold, they are entitled to use deadly force against me to break that chokehold, at least until we're separated. He had every right to say what he said. He had every right to exist and stick his hand out and try and survive to breathe another day. However, the use of force is not justified if you find that Sarah Bloom used the force to initially provoke the threatened use of force against herself, unless she does one of two things. And she did neither. Not even close. The threat of force asserted towards the defendant was so great that she reasonably believed that she was in imminent danger of death or great bodily harm. All right, let's give her absolutely every benefit of the doubt, which you should. This is a criminal prosecution. The state of Florida has alleged she committed murder. You need to do everything you can to look for reasonable doubt. But a reasonable doubt is not an imaginary doubt, forced doubt, speculative doubt. So accepting 
accepting that all of their past history, accepting the doctor's testimony and the limitations on what they reviewed compared to what we reviewed. We did a much more thorough review of the relationship than any of the doctors did in this case. So let's give her that first clause. Because of their past relationship with George now fighting for his right to exist and saying that he will end her if he gets out, we'll give her that. But just like Mr. Cacciatore mentioned earlier, lawyers' words mean things to us, and they mean things to everybody, but really to us. Or an and. There's an and. Had exhausted every reasonable means to escape the danger other than using deadly force on George Torres. She did not use every reasonable means to escape the danger that now, after provo provoking him, that he was presenting to her according to her. She didn't pick up her cell phone and start walking. Call 911. She didn't do anything other than, if you believe that is why she called Brian Boone, made a phone call to Brian Boone, and unfortunately because of past history, he just ignored her drunken phone call. She did not exhaust every reasonable means to escape this danger that she created. She started it. She created this, other than using the deadly force on George Torres. Now, this is a weird situation. This is not a rear naked chokehold. This is a suitcase, or as Mr. Cacciatore said, a box, or actually more aptly described it as a coffin. And when you secure somebody into a box or a coffin, you can still exert that deadly force on them from a distance. I'll give you a quick example from a couple of movies that I love. In 1977 in May, a movie came out, it's called Star Wars, they eventually called it Episode 4. In the first scene, there is this large imposing figure that wears black armor. He is a government agent and he is looking for some stolen classified documents. He picks a man up who he believes is responsible for this treachery and breaks his neck and chokes him to death when he doesn't tell him where the, the plans are. We all understand that. That is direct force we all understand. But what we need to understand is the force she's exerting from the couch. And then when she goes up to bed, she is still exerting that force on him. She set these implementations into motion and did not stop. So later in this movie that came out in 1977, another co-employee of this dark, imposing figure, Vader, insults his religion. He does not go to HR. He takes matters into his own hands and chokes this person from a distance. Ironically, while we're talking about force, it's the force. And then in the subsequent movie, he's like doing it from his office. He's, he's killing his incompetent employees on different ships. Force, deadly force, can be exerted from a distance in this situation. So whether she's on the couch or whether she turns in for bed, she is still using that deadly force on him. She has not exhausted every reasonable means to escape this danger. Do something. You started this. You put him in the position where he cannot breathe. She's required by the law to do something about it. Not something, everything. There was no efforts in this case. None. Or, in good faith, Sarah Boone withdrew from physical contact with Jorge George Torres and clearly indicated to George Torres that she wanted to withdraw and stop the use of deadly force. But Jorge, George, it just reads as Jorge. George Torres continued or resumed the threatened use of force. That did not happen. She never withdrew from physical contact. She is still, like Vader, choking him from the couch, choking him from bed. She never withdrew that force. Physical contact includes any restraint on George Forrest's movements. She never indicated that she wanted to withdraw. Sarah, babe, I can't breathe. All right, if I let you out, are you going to come out peacefully? Since I started this. I'm the one that made you not be able to breathe. That didn't happen. 
So ladies and gentlemen, this entire analysis about deadly force starts and ends there. She was the provocateur. These are her obligations when she starts it. She put him in fear of death. He is literally telling her, I cannot breathe. A couple other things about the law. Second degree murder does not require a proof of intent to kill. Argument was made repeatedly that she didn't intend to kill him. That has never been the state's suggestion. Because why would we suggest we prove something that we don't have to? It's not her subjective belief. Well, Sarah Boone doesn't believe that this suitcase can kill him. Even though he's repeatedly said, I can't breathe. It's a person of ordinary judgment who would know is reasonably certain to kill or do serious bodily injury to another. A person of ordinary judgment who hears, I can't breathe, babe, Sarah, and his voice gets weaker nine minutes later, you're on notice. This is statutory notice. Done from ill will, hatred, spite, or evil intent. Her words speak for herself. This was not out of fear. This was out of hatred and anger. Born out of all those horrible things that have been done to her and done to him, understand, we're not going to belabor the past, is of such neighbor that the act itself indicates an indifference in human life. I don't care that you're saying you can't breathe. Fuck you. That's my name. Don't wear it out. Fuck you. It's second degree murder. We do not have to prove the intent to kill. We have to, she intended the act. She intended the act of zipping him shut. She continued to in, intend that act when he said, I can't breathe. That act resulted in his death. That's a manslaughter, but then when you add in the hatred, ill will, spite, and the depraved mind, that's what makes it second degree murder. And that two minute video is the textbook definition of depraved mind as we define it here in Florida. Voluntary intoxication is not a defense. You cannot. Feel sorry for her because they had two 1.5 liter bottles of wine and then some from the leftovers from the day before. And quite frankly, she's blackout drunk. She's blackout drunk. She doesn't remember making the videos. She turns her phone over right to the deputy the next day because she doesn't know what's on it. She doesn't remember doing it. Another thing that we just haven't talked about much is her story. She can't be up in the shower hiding and taking a picture at 11.03 p.m., nine minutes before the video. That portion of her story just doesn't add up. And what it shows is it's more like 20 minutes instead of 11 or 12 minutes that we know he's trapped in what turns out to be his coffin. Let's talk about her testimony at trial. And we'll talk about all the problems. A lot of her issues predated her relationship with Mr. Torres. So it's not attributable to the trauma from Mr. Torres with all the luggage she brought into the relationship. And listen to the way she talks. It's not splitting the bills. It's helping without argument. It's not cleaning up and doing Sunday chores. It's, it's cleaning up so we can relax. It's a reward. She talks about him like he's a child. I need to lead him to the next activity from one to the other. And then you saw the videos, and I'm not going to belabor it, what that we showed in rebuttal, but the relationship and the power dynamics speak for itself. He was treated like the third dog, and it might very well have been a dog that bit and was violent, but he was treated like a dog. Why are you leaning against my door? Get out of here. Go downstairs. You're worthless. You're garbage. They showed the part of the video uh, where he slaps the phone, but that's after five or six minutes of being berated and dehumanized. Uh, in a way that nobody should be treated. He just wanted to get in bed and, and, and lay down next to his fiance. Instead, get away from the side of my door, you useless dog. I thought it might be a good point in time to listen to the music. You know, when does, when does Mr. Torres get to decide what to do? I mean, she, she paints this picture that he goes off and does all these things on his own. Um, goes and buys wine when he's not supposed to, does all these things when he's not supposed to, but when does he get to do what he wants? Suitcase downstairs for a week so they can donate it. What was in their lives that was preventing them from getting that suitcase to the Goodwill or whatever? Neither one of them worked. What's going on? Lucas is over there on Mondays and Tuesdays. 
The story about the suitcase having already been down there is quite suspect, and we will get into that more. But again, it's not we went on a trip together, we had a great time. It's, I quote unquote, I recently took him on a trip. Then it comes down to the moment of truth, which we've already gone over. And it's just quite frankly inconsistent because she doesn't, there's no explanation for the picture. Her explanation at trial when I brought it up to her was, I just don't remember. I don't remember this period in time from the picture at 11.03 to, to when I was supposed to be coming down the stairs. There's a major glitch in her matrix. She shakes the suitcase, please stop doing this to me. And then his hand gets out. Now she's the point in time where she gets angry and doesn't do what the law requires after basically choking him with his coffin. Beats him into submission with the bat and turns it back over. For the first time ever at trial, she says, I'm going to fucking end you, is what he said. She never told that to even her doctors. We've heard the arguments why she didn't tell the truth to the police and all, all that. And there's a lot of truth into the argument that was made. There's a lot of truth. When the argument is made that she didn't understand self-defense, what that means, what it comes across as, she makes this story change as she learns about it. When we apply the jury instructions to her statement, all six of them apply against her. Won't belabor this since it was discussed earlier, but did the witness have an opportunity to see and know the things about which the witness testified? Even at trial, she admitted that she was intoxicated for the first time. She went back and forth with the police about whether or not she was intoxicated and her standard of drunkenness and whatnot, but she was so intoxicated that she still felt the effects of it at one in the afternoon the following day. The medical examiner told you that alcohol dissipates in the average person, everybody's different, tolerance, all sorts of things come into play, but on average, 0.015, um, grams per deciliter will dissipate every hour. So you can do the math. 0.015 times 14 puts her at two and a half times the legal limit. For those reasons alone, you should not believe anything she told you. You should not believe anything she told the police. You should not believe anything she told the doctors. She was at two and a half times the legal limit. She has a gap in her memory that's unexplained when I brought up the photograph at 1103. You can't have it both ways. I don't remember 1103 to 1112, but I was upstairs in the shower hiding. Does the witness seem to have an accurate memory? Well, this ties into what we're talking about. But again, there's a glitch in the matrix, 1103 to 1112. Her memory is not accurate. By her own admission, I don't remember. She tells the police when they show her the video, I don't remember that happening. Was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? I submit when we got off script, and by we, I mean both, with both attorneys, she wasn't as honest and straightforward um, as when it was a very directed and smooth um, examination. I came out of the gate with something that um, was off script. Tell me about Pamela Erickson. Tell me about Christine. Tell me about Crystal. Because she's the one that said cheating to her meant pornography. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you know, she knew exactly who those people were and that she believed that he was cheating on them with her. And apparently she is too with some guy named Ben. That When I describe this as a violent, nonsensical relationship, that's exactly what it is. It's not to downplay the violence. She got stabbed. She had minor surgery. It got infected. She, she, those injuries are real but they just don't apply in this case. They just don't apply when you use that self-defense instruction when she's the aggressor, if it's to be believed. Judge, object. Approach, I proceed. Objections overruled. Let me say it loud and clear. Batter spouse syndrome does not have any effect on this case. It has no relationship to this case because she is the aggressor. She zipped him shut in the suitcase after he said, I couldn't breathe, she wouldn't let him out. Therefore, all of the instructions above that paragraph of however do not apply. They do not apply. Now, turning back to what I was saying, did the witness have some interest in how the case would be decided? Well, of course. Three out of four panels that y'all came from indicated to the judge 
fear of punishment was more important than the fear of public speaking. It speaks for itself. She has an interest in the outcome of the case. Now let's talk about does her testimony agree with the other evidence in the case? You do not have to accept this story. Let's pretend, as you should, because all six of these things, we haven't gotten to the inconsistent statements, let's pretend her testimony doesn't exist, and you just have to look at the circumstances. The testimony from the defendant is, George Forrest's head is here. You can stand if you need. We've been sitting a long time, too. His head is here. His butt is kind of down here. His feet are here. And his hands and his knees are up here. He's in the fetal position, if we remember right. The hematoma on his head is on the left side. The bruises, the deep bruises on his back are on his left side. That's, you hear that? That's solid. You don't have to accept that she put those marks on him while he was in there. The evidence doesn't support it. You can conclude she used this bat when he was outside the suitcase. You don't have to believe her when she said they were playing hide and seek. You don't have to believe her because she doesn't know the rules. She came downstairs, saw what she had done, and had all the opportunity in the world to clean up whatever mess may have been at the bottom of the stairs. But ladies and gentlemen, physics doesn't lie. She can't expect you to believe her testimony about the loud boom being the day before compared to her two neighbors who weren't drinking, who have no interest in the outcome of the case, who suffer from none of the infirmities of her testimony. She suffers from all six infirmities. When her neighbors say there was a loud boom that night, there was a loud boom that night. Did it shake the wall they shared in common? It shook the wall that they shared in common. Did she have any injuries consistent with being dragged up and down the stairs the night before? No. You saw the pictures the CSI took. You don't have to accept her story about hide and seek. Something made that loud boom. It takes energy to make a loud boom. Energy that could very well be in the form of somebody going down some of the stairs, all the stairs, in the suitcase, out of the suitcase, but that's what the evidence supports, is there was a loud boom that shook the walls and interrupted a FaceTime conversation that was so loud that the girlfriend on the other end heard it. Something loud happened. And then there was silence, according to the witnesses. And they can argue that Juan Torres' testimony was great for them. It's great for the state. She was screaming at him already at 7.30 p.m., she was already on her bully pulpit. And we know she doesn't need to put him into the coffin to get on her bully pulpit. There's video after video of her on her bully pulpit telling him how it's going to be, how you're going to live your life. Go take a walk. Do this. Do that. You don't have to accept anything she said. It's inconsistent that he received the hematoma to his head, his bloody mouth. How is his mouth getting bloodied inside the suitcase? That's protected from her and her bat. But that suitcase, a hundred pound drunk woman is not beating through the wood of that suitcase or whatever it is that's making that noise when it's thumped. Ladies and gentlemen, those injuries happen outside of the suitcase. Ladies and gentlemen, somebody or something went down those stairs. She has no injuries consistent with going down the stairs. He does. He has blunt force trauma all over him. You don't have to buy her story and you shouldn't. The inconsistencies, I'm not going to belabor it. Your dinner is waiting in back. Let's just briefly talk about the experts, and we'll move on to the end. Dr. Brandon was absolutely fantastic. He explained everything that you all needed to know about battered spouse syndrome. And this isn't about whether one of them or both of them had battered spouse, because at the end of the day, she's the initial aggressor, and she had the duty to do the things that the law requires. But it does call into question the credibility of the past power dynamics of their relationship. Those videos speak for themselves. 
the officer in, in the last video asks him, dude, you're a guy. Why don't you why don't you do something about this woman, your wifey, who you don't want to rat on for beating you? It's like, man, I'm not a beefcake. I'm not going to rat her out. There's countless examples, if you apply Dr. Brandon's testimony to Juan Torres, that really shows you the power dynamics of the relationship. He was her violent pet. Dr. Harper. I don't find much quarrel with what she says about battered spouse syndrome, and nobody should. I mean, she's the expert. But she's not Miss Boone's treating physician. She's not her treating psychologist. The way it was described in argument, and I believe from Dr. Brandon's testimony, was she's supposed to be a forensic detective. Get to the bottom of this. She's going to come in here at trial and tell you her opinion you should rely upon. With nine visits, she never asked the defendant, what it is the victim said that put you in imminent fear of death or great bodily harm? That's the crux of the matter, Doc. You're never going to ask her what it is he said or did for this grand jury instruction about threat of force or use of force? It's remarkable. And, you know, she didn't review everything that was presented to you. At the end of the day, it's your opinion that matters about this relationship. And again, we agree with Dr. Werner. It doesn't matter. She had the duty to retreat. She had the duty to take the chokehold off. And if it was too dangerous for her to directly take the chokehold off, she had the duty to do something else, everything in her power, to stop him from dying because she started it. She set it in motion. She used the force grip on him from a distance, the couch and from bed. She, it, it was her obligation to stop. She didn't. But Dr. Werner, she was called by the state of Florida after having evaluated and listened to the defendant give a similar story and concluded that spouse doesn't apply. So she was never asked to delve any deeper into it. Given the information that she did have, the limited information, she agrees. Yes, Ms. Boone has battered spouse syndrome, but it doesn't apply to the case because she was the aggressor and she did not fulfill her obligations. And really, just your gut common sense. Go back to jury selection. In jury selection, there was examples about bullies day after day doing something to somebody. And somebody raised their hand and said, don't they have to do something that day? Don't they have to do something that day? And he didn't. After he was put in fear of death and told her he can't breathe, the imminent threat of great bodily harm and death she is describing to you is him fighting for his life to escape. She did not fulfill her obligations. There's details that matter. And again, it's not to belabor it. I mean, the evidence in the, the body-worn camera and, and the 911 calls, it's not offered to prove the truth of the matter of as who stated what. Who knows what happened between these two? You see them with the police. Can't believe anything they're saying. It's not offered to prove that she's a bad person. It's not offered to prove that Mr. Torres is a bad person. It's simply offered to call in question the reliability and credibility of what she said about the past. That's all that it's there for. But there are some nuggets and some Easter eggs. There was an argument made during closings that um, Mr. Torres knows not to do anything when being videotaped. Bizarrely, shortly thereafter, they showed a very edited clip of him attacking her and slapping the phone out of her hand. He knows he was being videotaped, and there was another video like it, too. So to make the argument that he doesn't, he doesn't do anything, he's a good boy when he's being videotaped, it's, it's belied by their own argument. They showed the, one of the videos. Learned helplessness. She seemed to control everything. I mean, his birth certificate, it gets torn up when she, he doesn't comply with her wishes. Um, and you'll see the rest of the text messages if you choose to delve into them. But I would suggest you don't have to, given the, the jury instruction about aggressor. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a long two weeks, and you are making a very, very important decision for Ms. Boone, and a very, very important decision for Mr. Torres and the state of Florida and his family. He's dead. She killed him. She's admitting she killed him to have this affirmative defense of I was justified. It was not justified under our law. She does not get to decide that she has a license to kill because of her past grievances. 
the law requires her to stop using the force that she started applying to him. And she didn't. She didn't withdraw. She didn't tell him he was withdrawing. She didn't use every means available to try and stop this from happening. She didn't. And you know what was in her heart. She tells you. It's hatred, ill will, spite, and venom. This is not a self-defense case under the law. Go back and follow the law. You cannot feel sorry for her. You cannot feel sorry for him. You cannot feel angry at her. You cannot feel angry at him. It's maddening to see their relationship. It is maddening. Nobody would want this life for yourselves or your children. It is violent nonsense, but it does not affect what she did and what her duties were under the law that night. She wanted to punish him, she did, and then she left him there. And she had an obligation, if you even believe her story about the imminent threat for him fighting for his life, she had an obligation to do something about it and not just go upstairs and let him suffocate. Thank you. Thank you both. Members of the jury, I have some additional instructions to read to you. The necessary verdict form has been prepared for you. It is as follows. If you're looking for it, you don't have it. I do. <laughs> That's why we only have one. The verdict form reads, in the circuit court of the Ninth Judicial Circuit in and for Orange County, Florida, case number 48-2020-CF-002603-0, State of Florida Plaintiff versus Sarah Boone Defendant, verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree as charged in the information. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of the lesser included offense of manslaughter. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of the lesser included offense of culpable negligence. We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. So say we all, dated at Orlando, Orange County, Florida, on this blank day of blank, 2024, signed, four person. Ms. Boone, I've got a couple of questions to go over with you again, ma'am, if I could. You've been present throughout the entire trial, starting last week through today. You've been seated next to your lawyers at counsel's table. You've had the opportunity to observe the opening statements, the direct examination and cross-examination of all the state's witnesses, the direct examination and cross-examination of all the defense witnesses, and the opening or the closing statements as well that were presented by both sides. You've also had the opportunity to observe all of the exhibits that were presented as evidence in this case. Are you satisfied with your lawyers up and until this point? Absolutely. And are you in agreement with the strategy utilized in your defense? Yes. State, is there anything else we need to address? Hang on. Defense, anything else? Yes. All right, please give your cell phone numbers to Madam Clerk. We will be on verdict watch. Um, and I thank you all for your hard work in this case. We're off the record. <laughs> Let's go ahead and bring in our jury. Everyone will remain seated. Members of the jury, you may be seated. Thank you. Members of our jury, good evening. I understand that you've come to a verdict in this case. Yes. yes. If you could please hand the verdict form to the deputy, please. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Madam Clerk, if you could please publish the verdict. And into Orange County, Florida, case number 2020 CF2603, the state of Florida versus Sarah Moon. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree as charged in the information. So say we all, dated at Orlando, Orange County, Florida, on this 25th day of October 2024, the form has been signed by the courts. Madam Clerk, please poll our jury. Jury seat number one, is this your true and correct verdict? Yes, it is. Juror seat number two, is this your true and correct verdict? Yes, it is. Juror seat number three, is this your true yes, and correct is. verdict? Juror seat number four, is this your true and correct verdict? Yes. Juror seat number five, is this your true and correct verdict? Yes. Juror seat number six, is this your true and correct verdict? Yes, ma'am. Well, that's it. No big surprise there, huh? All I can say is that I hope Sarah Boone gets a nice long sentence in prison, or as her lawyer calls her, Sarah Boone, Sarah Boone, Sarah Boone. So I suppose we'll gather once again for sentencing, and then this woman will be out of our lives forever. I'll see you then.
With that, members of the jury, again, I thank you for your service. I'm going to ask you to return to the deliberation room. I'll be back there shortly with your jury certificates, and thank you.